absolutely think that growth is going to slow from here. You have, we believe, a slowdown coming, potential recession. Inflation, it's coming down, but it's going to remain elevated. The reality is, is there's just a lot less upside left in this rally and potentially meaningful downside. We do think something else will break between now and year end. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Can you sing O Canada? Can you sing that? It's a big question. You know the lyrics? Yeah, it's no, like, Canada. Nice. nice. <laughs> Blame Canada. Blame oh, Canada for the smog. French. Blame Canada for the bond market route. Live from New York City this morning. Good yes. morning. Good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramford. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market just about positive on the S&P 500. TK, blame Canada. I think we need to talk about the bond market first. <coughs> blame Canada with a surprise rate hike from the Central Bank of Canada following a surprise rate hike from the Australian Central Bank right. earlier this week. And TK, all of a sudden, the bond market gets a bit more jittery. Central banks like surprise. David Dodge invented this in Canada years ago. Jean Bovin is expert on this. I believe he was with the network yesterday. And the bottom line is surprise always is more efficacious for a central bank than something choreographed out like the idiocy of the dots. And the answer is they surprised yesterday. And you wonder, do we skip pause or do we light a bonfire at the Eccles building June 14th? <laughs> What's amazing about this is they communicated a conditional pause back in January and then delivered this line just yesterday, that monetary policy was not sufficiently restrictive to bring supply and demand into balance. And Lisa, there was a question I think a lot of people asked themselves yesterday is that statement in chairman powell's future exactly what seemed to be sort of implied in the market and if they're sort of committed to a skip what does that mean for the july meeting we now have a full rate hike baked in for july and really this has <clears> been <throat> the past few weeks of pricing out rate cuts and i think that has been the theme it continues to be the theme now yeah. just how high will the fed and what's interesting go? is some of the fed speakers in quiet period they're sitting at laguardia because they can't get back to <laughs> washington the situation this morning john is extraordinary and i really want to lead where it's grim Philadelphia. Sure. It is so bad in Philadelphia compared to what we're all living uh, in New York. And the ratios of this, I have an offspring in China, so he taught me how to keep track of this stuff on the, on the, on the iPhone. And the answer is it is unmeasurably grim. And I don't know when it ends. I mean, when did the, when did the fires stop in Quebec? A scorched earth. I was going through the numbers, Bloomberg putting them together, Tom. 9.4 <clears throat> million acres of burnt land in Canada, according to the Canadian National Fire Database. TK, double the size of New Jersey. We're talking about a yeah. lot. A and lot. A lot and far away as well. We don't need to do the weather forecast. Rob Carolyn, who is absolutely giant on this, is scheduled to join us. Uh, he's been just a, a strong supporter of surveillance over the years. But the answer is, like you say, the scale of it. And I don't know, do we say something, the wind shift, the low off Nova Scotia goes away and the wind shifts on Saturday? This is all a distant memory? I don't know. Kind of shocking, yeah. the last 24 hours. Yeah. Let's whip through the price section. <clears throat> Nothing Please. too shocking about that in the equity market. A bit softer yesterday on the S&P 500 this morning. Equity futures slightly positive by 0.05%. If you're looking at the bond market yesterday, yields adjusted higher. Right now, Lisa, just short of 380 there we go, 380.12 on a U.S. 10-year this morning. And that ratcheting up in yields really seems to be a theme, especially as we are expecting to get more data showing that the economy is resilient. 8.30 a.m. initial jobless claims, they really are still pretty low, even though people are still concerned about recession and some sort of uh, tightening or loosening, I should say, in the labor market. Curious to see whether that changes today. The Bloomberg Invest Conference does continue. Goldman Sachs' is John Waldron, Nassim Taleb uh, is going to be joining uh, this one anchor from television. I'm really looking forward to this. He's got a new book out. Scott Patterson wrote this up, and Taleb is on his game in 2023. Very much looking forward to that interview. I believe it's later this morning around 10 30 a.m. My Eastern. people haven't told me yet. It's Katie so, Koch, so, so. also of TCW, will be speaking. And at 4 30 p.m., I think this is interesting because sort of the backdrop to the pricing out of rate cuts is a banking crisis that's over. That seems to be the theme. So at 4 30 p.m., we get both the Fed balance sheet as well as discount lending out standings, basically emergency lending programs. Can we count the bank crisis as over yeah. as the Fed's balance sheet goes back to where it was before the really crisis? Really glad you did this, John. This is the heart of the matter. When you talk to all the strategists, they're looking at QT, QE, QTT, QEE is the tipping point of where we go into the third quarter. Alberto Gallo sat in that chair yesterday. <clears throat> yeah. He said if they want to tie a monetary policy, they need to do something about the long yeah. end. Others are talking. Ira Jersey's talking about Others this. talking about Tony it, Tony Dwyer's not talking about Tony Dwyer joins us now, chief market strategist <laughs> at Canaccord Gemity. Now for 
our audience elsewhere, you might think this is going to sound like a bit of a diet, a workout regime, but it's not. It's about markets. Tony, you said light and tight. You want to be light and tight through most of this <laughs> summer. Just walk me through where you are now, just positioning your approach to this market at the moment. Well, first is, is working for a Canadian company. Don't blame us for everything. Um, <laughs> in addition, it's great to have you, you three back. So, um, so John, it, you know, light and tight basically means keep a little extra cash and be a little bit more on the defensive side. And I, I've been hopefully very clear every time we've been on. I don't think you want to be Armageddon negative, even though economically I still expect a recession. I think, you know, ultimately there's three stages of a market decline. There's first or a market um, scenario when you're in a Fed tightening cycle. First, good news is bad news because it means the Fed's going to get tight. We obviously saw that in 2022. Then you get bad news is good news because that means the Fed's going to be stopping and you get a rally and we saw a couple of those. But ultimately, if you do go into a recession, bad news is bad news. The market goes down and that's when you want to be poised to attack. And right now, I think there's this, this great hope guys, that there's a, a soft landing coming. And, and to me, that's still the worst case scenario. I look, Tony, at the equity markets, and you've been so good about this, saying we're not going to be cautious until we see recession. Do you see recession? And is that the cause for your caution? It, it is, and it has been. So, so guys, I, I constantly hear, all right, smart guy. Well, they don't say smart guy. All right, where is this recession? You've been talking about it for the last six months. <laughs> Ultimately, um, with my friends at Ned Davis, they have a great chart that shows when you look at the six month to 10 year US Treasury yield curve, which is the widely followed yield curve, historically, there's a lead time from the initial inversion to recession of 11 months. Now, the variability is about eight months to 21 months. The 21 months was before the great financial crisis. So think about that. We're, we're now about nine and a half months into it. So don't you think somewhere around the 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 month mark before the great financial crisis, everybody was saying, OK, where's the recession? You've been talking about it for a while. And eventually it did come. Uh, and, it, and it always is coming from credit. And this time, you know, you did a great job showing the, the QT, the balance sheet. Ultimately, bank failures or the systemic risk in banking wasn't the issue. It comes down to lending. And my issue looking for recession is where is good, you know, where are you going to get the money? If lending standards are tight, if the financial markets are still, you know, mixed at best, especially relative to a year ago, and you're already at full employment, where are you going to get that incremental money to have a sharp growth rate? Right now, people are talking about positioning defensively at a time when recession may be on the table at some point, but it keeps getting pushed out. I keep wondering, what does it mean to be defensive at a time when yesterday you saw bonds sell off and you saw tech sell off because suddenly it was interest rate sensitive again? Right, Lisa. It's so, so defensive to me is not mega cap tech stocks. Um, it never has been. I, I would not have been, you know, levered long in that space um, with AI. I wouldn't have. I don't. I don't think that for us, most portfolio managers, if you guys have covered uh, a lot, hit, you can't be long just those eight stocks. And up until last Thursday, prior to the payroll report, you had eight of the 11 sectors in the S&P 500 down more than 2% for the year. So sometimes we kind of do this as made for TV, what's your S&P target. But when you talk about a strong market, you have to say, okay, what market are you talking about? If you're talking about the broad market, which, by the way, is having a little bit of a rally, and we wrote a note called the hustle of the Russell um, yesterday, you're getting this a little bit better rally on the hopes that you can avoid a recession. But defensive to me is healthcare, utilities, those, those consumer staples that will typically hold up when you have a top line slow down economically. Tony, how concerned are you that right now you are seeing a growing number of people go into riskier securities, go into the AI story just ahead of something that could be possibly problematic? Do you feel like people are getting lured in just before the kill? <laughs> just before the kill is, uh, I don't know that I'd phrase it that way, Lisa. Uh, but yes, the, the answer is yes. You got a VIX at 13. Um, you got people day trading the zero date options. Like, you know, it's the, to me, that's just simply gambling. Um, you've got so many different factors. And, and again, it's this idea of, okay, where's the recession? Maybe we're going to have the soft landing. But ultimately, we're, we're doing nothing differently in his, than history. You know, your right. shortest duration between an inversion and a recession is eight months. Um, going back to the 1960s, we're at nine right. and a half, the median's 11. Tony, it's TV. What's your target on the S&P? 
you know what, Tom? I stopped doing it. So here's what I'll give you. I'll give you this. The and 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 this goes into kind of the new metric of higher. Tony, it's not a philosophy rates. show. What's your damn target on the S and P? I, I don't. I'm not going to give you one, but oh, I'm going to give you an me. earnings estimate of two hundred and ten dollars versus the street of two hundred and twenty. So I'm a little bit below the street. Okay. If you look at the current price of the S and P five hundred, it gives you a PE of about twenty and a half. That's too high. Um, when you even look at the earnings yield, it's more like about 5% when you're getting almost 5.34% on the six months. So you don't have to make a big downside bet. You don't have to make a big upside bet. It's a very unclear environment. It's like the, the skyline in New York right now with, with wildfires. When you don't need to make a bet, I don't force it because what happens is when I do and it looks wrong, I capitulate too quickly because I don't have a high conviction level in it. I have a high conviction we're going to go into a recession. And when we do, and if the market does respond with bad news becoming bad news, I want to be in a position to attack it, which means a little bit extra cash but not overly defensive, not Armageddon, you know, get only into the defensive, be tight relative to the benchmarks with a little underweight in mega cap and a little overweight in smaller cap. Came really close to giving us a price target then, too. He made us do the math. Yeah, yeah, gave, gave, gave the earnings and told you what the multiple should be. You guys are good be. at math, two right? 210 <laughs> plus, it's got an 11 multiple on it. Tony, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Down to 2,400. Tony of Canaccord Genity. Tony, appreciate it, as always. Don't worry, we are going to talk about this. Messi, we need to talk about this. Not just because I of the said... sport, but also <clears throat> because of the business deals here. Little Messi, arguably one of, if not the greatest football player ever, going down to Miami to play for David Beckham's into Miami. And Tom, the profit sharing deals that we could see with Adidas and also with Apple. So we've now got this big multi-year deal for the MLS but, to be okay. streamed on Apple TV, Tom, and there's going to be a profit-sharing deal with Messi and subs, according I, I, to the I, I, Athletic. I, That's amazing. He's a quasi-owner, but basically he's going to a minor league team, right? Yeah, not a great team at all. Okay. And turning down big money to do it. Turning down big money. Couldn't We're going to have that conversation a little bit later. I'm sure he could. <clears throat> Whether he wants to is a, a different story, Tom. Ed Yardeni in the next hour. The president of Yardeni Research, constructive on this equity market and why this might be the mother of all mount-ups. The conversation just around the corner. Future's just about unchanged. This is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo some 230 square miles of ukraine's southern herson region is underwater two days after the destruction of the kohovka dam now regional governor says almost a third of the flood zone where thousands are being evacuated is held is held by ukrainian forces while the rest is russian occupied territory now kiev is assessing the humanitarian economic and ecological damage of the disaster that western leaders denounced as a war crime. Bloomberg has learned a mood of deepening gloom is gripping Russia's elite about prospects for President Vladimir Putin's war in Ukraine. Sources say many within the political and business elite are tired of the war and want it to stop, though they doubt Putin will halt the fighting. President Biden has vetoed a bill initiated by congressional Republicans that was designed to repeal the administration's student debt cancellation plan. Now, Biden's executive action would forgive up to $20,000 in federal student loans for some borrowers. But the battle is far from over as his plan still faces justices in the Supreme Court. And apartments in Manhattan are being snapped up at the fastest pace in nearly a year, just ahead of the busy summer season. Appraiser Miller Samuel and brokerage Douglas Elliman Real Estate say units were listed for an average of 35 days, down from 48 days in April and 52 a year earlier. This despite the higher cost for rent. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. How do we make sure that that relationship is strong to deal with the challenges of the future? I know that's what we're going to be talking about, but particularly strengthening our economies. And that's what it's all about. It's important. You know, what was it, uh, like 81 years ago, another prime minister 
Winston Churchill wasn't came here and we'd have to speak in Congress. I think we'll just build on what he talked about too. Yeah, it's a great foundation for us to cooperate on. So Thank no, you. it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. The British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and the House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in Washington, the Prime Minister visiting Washington, D.C. I understand seeing the President as well. Might build on that a little bit later, or maybe That was McCarthy's not. best meeting yesterday. That was it? That was, that was it. That yeah, was Emory going to be along on a truly historic felt a little bit contrived house. that, didn't it? You, you, think? <laughs> you think? That odd exchange when between doubt, the two of them. When in doubt, mention Churchill. Mention Churchill and just be like, <laughs> yes. you know, talk about winging it, right? Ch mention Churchill. I guess we'll just build on that. Whatever he said, I mean, maybe did, one years ago. It did feel like, okay, I say nice thing, you say nice thing. We're doing well right here, yeah? Okay. <laughs> you sort of leaning towards the PRs to <laughs> scream, at, scream <laughs> at the press to get out. Everyone get out, clear out, <laughs> get out. Okay, if you're just tuning in, welcome to the programme. Let's whip through the price action on the S&P 500, slightly positive. Lita went through the data for the day ahead. Jobless claims coming up in about two hours and ten minutes' time. Look out for that. So far, the labour market looking okay. Depending on what labour market data you look at, if you look at the payrolls survey out on Friday, things look pretty decent. <coughs> you look at the household survey and the unemployment rate and things are starting to crack. Maybe, maybe, maybe. we'll see what claims bring in a couple of hours' time. Yesterday, yields higher. Today, just a little bit. Back at 380 on a US 10-year. The Bank of Canada with the latest surprise following the central bank out of Australia with a surprise rate hike this week as well. And Tom... <coughs> Just reintroducing some of the risk around next week, maybe. Andrew Hoddenhorst and the team at City, economists there, calling correctly that Canada would hike interest rates yesterday, still calling for a hike of 25 basis points next week from the Fed. They've been dead on. And again, it goes to data dependency. Why are they going to decide now about what they're going to do uh, June, whatever? They're going to wait for the inflation data, wait for other data as well, including, frankly, claims in the dynamics here uh, in two hours' time. CPI Tuesday. <clears throat> CPI That's the next Tuesday. hurdle. Yeah. You're right. And I just think we're data dependent here with futures up three at right now. The 10-year yield we're all watching, 3.80%. Imagine a 4% 10-year. Right now on Ukraine, and she has been so, so dead on. Tina Fordham on the tragedy of Ukraine, founder and geopolitical strategist, Fordham Global Insight. Could you imagine a dam breaking and the damage to Kherson and southern Ukraine? Did you see that coming, Tina Fordham? Well, we know that these kinds of tactics are pretty consistent with Russia's uh, kind of scorched earth MO. And in fact, the Ukrainians told us that the Russians had mined the dam. Um, and so we should have been prepared for something like this. Uh, we're in a very critical phase as we are in late spring with Ukraine's uh, offensive much anticipated. They keep denying um, or you know, kind of hushing up when it's happening. This is really consistent with uh, what Clausewitz called the, the fog of war. And, and that's very much where we are at this stage in the conflict. How does this event change, I guess, the state of Ukraine and the war, and particularly the relationship of Ukraine to their allies? Well, it's a setback, although, of course, the Ukrainian Defense Ministry and, and President Zelensky are, are soft peddling that. I mean, Ukrainians morale remains remarkably high, troop morale and, and citizens. Um, they're evacuating people. They'll deal with the humanitarian consequences. But you've seen, for example, that the water supply uh, from the Kakhova Dam uh, is important, according to the IAEA, for cooling the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, which is something that, that I've been talking about, kind of uh, below threshold actions um, that would uh, constitute a, an escalation. And this is what investors are watching for, of course. Is the war escalating in a meaningful way where there might be spillover. Um, certainly the risk temperature now is much higher, but let's also bear in mind that Ukraine, in, its, in terms of its military preparedness, is in a much stronger position than it was this time a year ago. It's got the Leopard tanks, it's got the, the Abrams tanks. Uh, in fact, uh, apparently the first um, NATO supplied tanks seen on the battlefield were, were French. Um, so uh, they are trained now in offensive maneuvers, but the pressure on this, the, the success of this offensive is extremely high. There's no question about it. Um, 
the patience is, is running out, although the show of strength in terms of support for Ukraine at the G7, it, it remains very high, I think, defying a lot of international observers. Um, but uh, there's no doubt in my mind that everybody wants to see Ukraine um, gain leverage. Tina, a lot of the uh, focus right now is on the alliances, and that's the reason why uh, perhaps some people, not us obviously, are, are focusing on Rishi Sunak down in Washington, D.C. I am wondering <clears throat> if you do think that is of interest in any way, that sort of plain vanilla conversation that we just heard of sort of vaguely self-congratulatory uh, back and apart forth. Apart from being so cringy. I mean, I, but, was, but just in general, is there anything you're expecting to hear from this uh, confab down in Washington, D.C. with Rishi Sunak? For sure, they'll announce a show of unity and strength on Ukraine, and they will announce plans to continue arming and training Ukraine. That is a given. What Rishi Sunak, the U.K. prime minister, is not going to get is the digital trade deal slash, um, you know, rare minerals, uh, narrow trade deal that he's hoping for. Remember, he's a prime minister of a government that's 20 points behind in the polls. And the UK has elections next year, as well as uh, the United States. Um, so he's a prime minister in a weak position. Um, and the relationship is frankly less of a strategic priority for Washington than when the UK was one of the most important uh, members of the European Union and had a lot of other fellow free trade Atlanticist uh, powers standing alongside it. So I think Sunak will be disappointed, but he'll still come away with something to show for his visit to DC. How does that characterization of the UK stand up to the need for UK <clears throat> military support in places like Europe, the mainland, and the situation with Ukraine? So this is really important, and I think I wanted to emphasize it for your international audience. Even if there is a Labour government next year, and I, I'm not making that call, despite the you know very pronounced lead in the polls, a lot can happen, as we know, you're not going to see a change away from the UK stance in support of Ukraine. Uh, of, of this, um, we can depend. Tina Fordham, a Fordham Global Foresight. Tina. Thank you on the latest, the visit from Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister, down in Washington, D.C. Got a ton to talk about this morning. Tom, you mentioned we're going to catch up with a meteorologist a little bit later <coughs> about the smog, the weather in New York City. Need to catch up on the sport as well, this PGA lift tie-up and this amazing it's deal. It's bigger today than it was yesterday. This amazing yeah. deal secured by Lionel Messi and Major League Soccer in the United States. Truly setting some amazing precedents here. Tom, I was trying to describe to you in the commercial break what this could look like in, say, Major League Baseball. Can you imagine, let's say, and I know the network situation and televising Major League Baseball is a mess, mm -hmm. but let's say there was one network and let's say it was, let's say it's ESPN, and ESPN came <clears throat> up with some kind of profit-sharing deal with Aaron Judge, yeah, which essentially was subsidising the payroll of the New York Yankees. How do you think the other franchises would feel about I, that? It's truly amazing to see something like this develop. Yeah, Craig Moffat and Michael Nathanson, I think, among others, have been way out front on this. And what it is is about desperation. And I think certainly PGA Live goes directly into that. It's a desperation here of the old days are over, the captured audience is over, and what do we do? And to do that, you have to co-opt the players, as you mentioned with Mr. Messi. I mean, it's clearly where you tried it with Pele back in the 70s, right? Tom, right? What would tried it with Beckham. Five years ago, what would Brady have negotiated? What, with the network? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, you know, per game fee, profit taking off. The issue is that I think there's a decent argument to make that a player that good with that status just has this transformative impact on a franchise, just the sporting world in this country in a way that a single player in, in baseball or American football does I, not. I don't know. I just got a message here from Tottenham, and they said, really, went to Miami. And Spurs were in the race. Be, Spurs was on the short list. Yeah, absolutely. Alex Webb's going to join us a little bit later to have a proper conversation about this. I'm looking forward to that. Jeff Yu of BMY Mellon joining us shortly on the equity market and beyond. Stocks right now, just about positive from New York. This is Bloomberg. Lots of messages from East London this morning. Why aren't you talking about West Ham? Well, congratulations, West Ham. I just didn't want to explain to Tom what the Conference League was and I have no interest spending any time doing that this morning. But 
Congratulations, West Ham. Jeff, you're alongside me laughing because he knows where I'm going with this. I'm not going anywhere with this. Your equity market on the S&P 500. Just about positive on the S&P this morning. Positive this morning, a lift yesterday, the NASDAQ 100, a drop, a big drop. Biggest one-day drop going back to late April. We were down about 1.8% yesterday. <coughs> Finally, apparently, bond market moves do matter to the tech stock rally story. The two-year this morning, 4.56.51, yields up a little bit, up a lot yesterday, off the back of a surprise rate hike from the Central Bank in Canada, following another surprise earlier this week from the Central Bank of Australia, and raising a question as to whether we might get some surprises in the Fed's future as well. Bear in mind that only at the start of this year, the Bank of Canada was communicating a <coughs> conditional pause. Does that sound familiar? Is that what we'll get from the Federal Reserve next can, Wednesday? Is there such a thing as a conditional skip? A conditional skip? A conditional That's pause. That's how silly this is. I they're like the spend, Bank of They're going to spend 24 approach. hours talking about this. <clears throat> Are we sufficiently restrictive? Don't, you can wait I, I, and find out. I'm all Bank out. of Canada on this. You know. Do you think surprise? Just, just go an, for it. Just make an announcement. Just move make on. an announcement and move, move on. on. Yep. Do you have the luxury of doing that if you're the Federal Reserve? Not in the communicative the strategy of, Canada. of this year. I'm going to offend Canada again this morning. Forgive you're me. You're doing good. You're kill second tier Luke central Cowan. bank. It's a second tier central bank. Okay. When you're a second-tier central bank, you have the luxury of delivering surprises. I don't think you have yeah. the same luxury if you're the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, for that matter. We'll probably hear from Mr. Trudeau today not only on central banking, but also on fires that have gripped the nation and particularly the Northeast. We are thrilled to bring you our senior vice president, lack of hysteria. Rob Carolyn has done weather for Bloomberg surveillance since time began and joins us on radio and television. Rob, thank you for taking uh, time out in a crushing schedule. When do the fire, when do the, the smoke, when does the fumes, when does it all move on? Uh, it's going to move on this weekend, Tom. There's going to be a change in the flow pattern. Right now, we're in a stagnant pattern with an upper level low of the northeast. But by the weekend, that system breaks down and moves out, and we should see in a bit of an improvement. Rob, how does this compare to the rest of the world, what we're going through right now in New York uh, City, in the tri-state area? New York area? City had the worst air quality in the world both uh, yesterday and the day before, Jonathan, off the scale for particulate matter uh, floating through the atmosphere in New York yesterday and the day before. Rob, it's just amazing. Have you ever seen anything like this in your career? No. You got to go back to uh, um, May 19th of 1780 to have anything of any precedence in the Northeast. Uh, that was called the dark day in New England. Wildfire smoke caused uh, people to have to use candles at noon <laughs> from Portland, Maine, all the way to New Jersey on that date in 1780. So it's been a long time since we've seen something like this. Do you have any ability, Rob? One final question here before we move on. Do you have any ability to say this will be repeated through the summer? When you look at Canadian weather people and all about the fire, can this happen again? It could happen again, uh, Tom. My hope is that this next upper level low that moves in Monday through Wednesday is going to bring some rain eventually to parts of Quebec and Ontario and maybe help reduce some of those fires that are currently taking place. Hey, Rob, it's been too long. It's wonderful to get your perspective on things. Rob Carroll in there of Hometown Forecast Services. TK, some seriously crazy smog <clears throat> in New York City, like real pollution. Real. Waking up this morning, coming to work, you can smell it. Oh, yeah. You can oh, really, no. you know, you can smell and, it. And, the, and uh, I noticed the dogs, Vet Bill and, and uh, Kennel, they're suffering. just mental. Yeah, they're just, yeah, it's definitely there. We should point out the airlines, I don't have an update right now, but incoming flights, the last I heard to LaGuardia and Newark, were challenged, so, to say the least. I saw some delays yesterday, particularly yeah. LaGuardia, yeah, for <clears> we'll obvious get reasons. more on that as we start up the day. Let's continue on now, and we do so with Jeffrey Yu visiting with Paul Sweeney yesterday at his BNY Mellon conference in Florida, and it's jetted up. Uh, to join us. He is senior market strategist, BNY Mellon. It, it, it's a quiet period, but it's not a quiet period. I'm going to ask you an open question to start. Equities, bonds, currencies, commodities, where is your single focus now into the Fed meeting? Uh, I think the single focus is we need to acknowledge higher for longer. My single focus is those residual Fed cuts that still seem to be the market is intent on pricing and heading into next um, January probably needs to get rid of them. Yeah. We talked about the fog as being sort of a metaphor right now for yeah. a lot of the uncertainty that we have in the market. It's unfortunate and convenient. However, I do wonder how much this lack of conviction makes you have all that much more conviction in cash. Because if you could just sit there and earn something, you know, even if you're not throwing, you know, throwing blowing 
blowing it out of the water, it's better than nothing. Uh, that's uh, been the uh, theme uh, that we've observed in our flows um, for the best part of the last six, um, probably um, uh, six months, uh, uh, if not longer. But having said that, there is one new dynamic seemingly um, coming through. Things are flatlined, so people are not adding to more cash because uh, they're seeing that allocations are just so low right now to risk. Uh, and uh, the institutional um, investors you know, that we custody for, I think they're starting to push some funds, in, uh, not not speculatively uh, but, uh, or opportunistically, uh, but they're looking at valuations and they're looking at the growth environment. It could be a bit more benign than we give it credit for, so uh, funds are actually being pushed back in. In the next half hour, yeah. we're going to be speaking with Eddie Ardenny, who's going to talk about the mother of all melt-ups, MAMU, as he calls it. And I'm wondering how much this positioning right now of an increasing amount of cash is actually being a uh, you know, fuel for this mother of all melt-ups that could be coming. Uh, I think it is you know, going to be the fundamental asset allocation story you know, for the second half of the year. But on top of that, the macro picture is, can we dare to envisage maybe a soft landing? Again, I was having a, a few conversations around this. If we can get to, say, year-end um, with um, you know, still payrolls around 200, 250,000, but core inflation, core PC on the way down to 4, 4.5%, I think that is a good environment. That's a good result. Uh, so uh, if that translates into the corporate profitability, stability, and earnings growth as well, uh, then with the cash on the sidelines, your better return profile, why not push cash back into equity? I feel like right now there's two different views. Either you just sit in cash, take five, mm -hmm. or you go to AI and chase hopes and dreams. Right. Is there something in between uh, right now for you? It's, it's that bubble story um, as well. If there's still one asset class I have conviction um, on um, globally, I think it's emerging market assets. A lot of interest in LATAM right now. The benefiting from a uh, US story is still positive. B, I do think a China stimulus is coming as well on the commodity side and see credibility in that region in terms of positive real rates. We always go back to the real rate story. The Fed is giving you a 1% or so real rate buffer, uh, but in LATAM, they're giving you 2, 3, if not higher. So in terms of asset allocation, the residual flow, I think a lot can go there too. China stimulus, what are you expecting? Uh, so if we use the benchmark you know, from, from years ago where they had that tax cut round as around 2 <coughs> trillion RMB mark, that is the baseline, like the bare minimum to really make a difference um, to uh, the data. But on top of that, I think there needs to be a shift in expectations. You know, when I was uh, uh, there for the first time in many, many years a few months ago. You know, there was um, just this palpable fear that you know, things could still go back to you know, where they were a few months ago, but uh, that clearly is not the case you know, right now. So there's got to be a governmental push, um, but again, encouraging the private sector that they can leverage, they can add um, to their balance sheets uh, and move on accordingly, because China's been like, de-risking, de-leveraging over the last two years. To, to China, yeah. and, and, and it's, the last 24 hours has been mm -hmm. just extraordinary. How do you treat the IMF's cautious five-year view, even what OEC did yesterday, do you just instantly say, I want to be suspect of that and take mm -hmm. a contrarian, more optimistic view mm -hmm. on global GDP? Uh, well, I think global GDP is reflective <clears throat> of you know, where global productivity is, where global demographics are. You know, China's own growth forecast, if we go back to March, uh, you know, when they came out with the growth targets to the MPC, that was considered conservative at the time, especially if uh, we take into account the uh, rebound and the rebalancing <clears throat> coming through. Uh, but then if that is a warning signal, then I think it gives the impetus you know, for governments to spend to invest, to boost productivity, to boost growth and get things you know, back I mean, on track. Leland Miller at China Beige Book is, is heated mm -hmm. that the street has this wrong. He's far more optimistic mm -hmm. of a domestic Chinese experience and says it will even come over to a per mm -hmm. Pacific Rim statement. Is this the mother of all opportunities we're missing? I wouldn't say it's the mother of all opportunities, <clears throat> um, but uh, given the last three years, um, you know, China's always been an afterthought in terms of asset allocation because of lockdown, because of other factors, mm -hmm. there is an opportunity um, set there as well. But having said that, going to the fiscal story, that's also one thing I deeply worry about you know, globally um, right now. Uh, when the IMF and with um, Chancellor Hunt um, just uh, upgraded uh, ports for the UK, one thing George Ava said was, um, please don't do additional fiscal stimulus right now. We've seen what happened in Turkey before the elections. We've seen what's happening in Poland you know, right now. Um, New Zealand, for example, pushing through stimulus. That's the last thing central banks uh, need right now. To be honest, even the debt seems debate may be the fiscal uh, uh, consolidation, shall we say, was you know barely anything. So central banks, you know, they need some help from the governments. That was the most diplomatic way of saying they actually didn't make any progress in cutting any kind of spending whatsoever in the debt ceiling debate. Yeah. Just sort of putting this all together, yep. this is a time of mid-year reviews. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there were a number of high conviction trades in the first half mm -hmm. that were absolutely demolished, annihilated. Right. What are some of the conviction trades heading into the second half that you're concerned about? And I think about the conviction trades mm -hmm. that you talked about of AI and long cash. Right. Uh, so in terms of AI, um, do we want to think, you know, that is is that uh, you do have the growth story, you have the innovation story, um, but uh, is, 
is is there a Tina focus in there again? And I do have some cash allocations to push for. I will just you know, go with um, the Tina theme. So I think that is you know one thing to uh, bear in, uh, in, in mind. Uh, but going back to my earlier point about Fed cuts need to be priced out. One conviction view that we have is this higher for longer narrative globally. And we're talking about potentially you know, no cuts from major central banks at all until at least the second half of next year. Wow. Whereas, you know, that is not something that's priced in, I would say, the Fed or anywhere globally because it's sticky inflation. Persistent inflation and fiscal is only going to make that worse. And we've got quite a few elections you know, coming up globally over the next 18 months as well. And we love electoral giveaways on the fiscal side, don't we? So that's where curve steepening bond yields. Will we even be looking at, say, JGB 10 years at 1.5%? These wow. themes are going to come through. Yeah. Hey, Jeff, that's interesting. Jeff, you there at BNY Mellon, looking forward to 18 months of politics and financial market volatility, <coughs> potentially, TK. It's amazing to see the technocrats and the central bankers warn about fiscal stimulus. He you was... hear it from the ECB as well. They're uncomfortable I... with the nature of fiscal support for paying energy bills now that energy is priced lower. So my takeaway is, Jeff, you on the edge of Bullard. I mean, you know, that's this is important, what, what Jeff, you just said here about not extending out the rate cut derby now, but getting out into the second half of next year. Of 2024. Yeah, that's a big deal. To Lisa's point, and we've been talking about this for weeks now in this program, we've just spent six months beating up on consensus positions. Coming into 2023, no one liked tech, tech ripped. Coming into What's 2023, it was about now? rate cuts, had to price them out. 2023, it was about short the dollar. Then the dollar started that to strengthen. Long Europe, long China, Europe, technically. Can I call that a recession in Europe now, Jeff, with that revised data? Uh, so, uh, I think can I call be, it that? The ECB would beg to differ for now, but let's see what the forecasts are in a week's time. The two quarters of negative growth <laughs> in Europe after the revised data. Q4, Q1, China. China, we have Think about the China conversation. We've gone from reopening boom to China needs stimulus I, in yeah. six months. The big fear that I have is that you get sort of a battle between central bankers and the fiscal policymakers, especially with these election cycles. If they keep coming out and saying, we have to keep spending to keep the population OK, and then central banks have to respond. It's the point that Jeff is making, and ultimately, Tom, it can lead to high yields. Sleeper curves for longer. The key thing into is next year. longer, the time frame. Yeah. Jeff, great to see you, buddy. Likewise. Just fantastic. <clears throat> I've missed you. It's good to see you in person. Equity is just about positive on the S&P 500 from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The mayor of New York has told residents to stay indoors or wear N95 masks if they go outside as the most polluted air in decades blankets the region. And this as wildfires continue to ravage large tracts of forests in Canada, sending smoke more than 1,000 miles southwards. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says it's the worst wildfire season in Canada's recorded history. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy called off votes for the remainder of the week and sent lawmakers home. A revolt by Republican hardliners halted business in the chamber for a second day. The blockade by a band of 11 ultra-conservatives heightened tensions among Republicans following the Speaker's backing of a compromise with the White House to avert a U.S. debt default. The Speaker says he was blindsided by the revolt. Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong says the SEC started to change its tone in its questioning of the company last year before filing the lawsuit against the crypto exchange. He told Bloomberg that the firm had been forthcoming with discussions but was unfortunately met with silence. This was not um, unexpected. You know, we've been in discussion with the SEC for a long, long time. Even going back to before we were a public company, we started sharing with them how we operate our business, how we list assets on the platform, how we think about our staking pro program. And through a large number of dialogues back and forth, they allowed us to become a public company. Um, you know, we had many discussions with them in the last year when their, their tone started to change. This week, the SEC has widened its crackdown on crypto and has accused Coinbase of running an illegal exchange. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. The AIs have sort of dominated the long portfolio for five or six months. If it's as big as I think it is, um, 
NVIDIA is something we're going to want to own for at least two or three years, not for 10 months. And maybe longer. Just an absolute clinic from famed legendary investor Stanley Drucker Miller there. Not just on AI, but Tommy talked about long short, how he likes to play short because yeah. he enjoys it, but ultimately that's not where the money's made. I really say this, but I want you to sit, folks, on the digital replay of this a good 20, 30, 40 minutes with Mr. Drucker Miller. And there's some interesting stuff in it and tangential political stuff and all that. He is absolutely brilliant on the mathematics of shorting, much like what I'm going to talk to Taleb about uh, today. It is a required listen for anybody young on Wall Street about the entertainment of shorting versus actually not losing money at shorting. Well, that's the point. He said, um, <clears throat> yeah. you go long, you can lose 100%. You go short, Tom, it, it you was, can lose a whole it, lot more. It, Jim Shanos would say the same thing, but there's some real high points uh, within this conversation. Because of time, we're going to move on. Rishi Jaluria with us. He's with RBC Capital Markets, and all you need to know is Microsoft. He's truly expert on this. Rishi, I want to get away from all the blather on AI, chat GPT. I'm hearing some real authenticity about chat GPT. What's it mean on the income statement for Microsoft five years out? Which margin line are you focused on, and what will be the delta of improvement due to AI? Yeah, and thanks so much for having me. Uh, look, when it comes down to how this flows through to the PNL, um, the great thing with Microsoft is there's many different ways that they win, right? It, it uh, shows up on Azure because of the commercial arrangement with OpenAI, um, you know, helps on on their entire product portfolio. Um, now, now you bring a, a, an interesting point because I think there's there's the whole back end, and you know, by utilizing um, generative AI themselves, you get all sorts of savings on R and D with uh, significantly <clears throat> higher developer productivity, uh, better sales and go to market, even you know some GNA leverage. But the one line it actually hits in in a potentially negative way is on uh, the COGS line, right, and your gross margin, if you're looking at it purely on a margin perspective, uh, because the amount of storage and compute resources necessary for generative AR are significantly higher uh, than what we see with right. the traditional cloud workloads. However, there's also a dollar uplift. So if we're looking at this on purely a an EPS or a dollar net income basis, all of this is accretive because there's so much more that Microsoft can charge for these generative AI enabled workloads uh, or, or any sort of technology that's embedded throughout the portfolio well, that utilizes generative AI. So this should all be accretive to EPS in the long term, even if it means a gross right. margin but hit over the long term. I, I get the idea there may be a revenue pop at the top line of the income statement, but if I got 68 cents on the dollar gross margin, 48 cents on the dollar EBITDA, what are those dynamics three or five years out? Have you been able to quantify that yet with all the hoopla? You know, it, it, it's still very early to be able to tell that. I will say our own models, the way we've kind of been thinking about this is, is remember, when we went from an on-premise world, uh, we went from 90% uh, gross margins to 75% gross margins, which is your average SaaS company. Um, in reality, we may see a move from 75% gross margins to 60% gross margins across the board, but there's also this big, you know, 2x to 3x uplift we saw from going um, on-premise to cloud. And I think we see that similar uplift. So even if the margins uh, end up actually being lower, although I think EBITDA margins may end up being flat at the end of the day, um, your, your overall gross profit dollars, your overall EBITDA dollars will actually end up going up a lot as a result of generative AI. One thing that's a, sort of a distinguishing feature between the cloud, which is all sort of in the ether and sort of runs on energy and that's sort of the physical reality of it versus generative AI and chat GPT is the physicality that we haven't yet imagined. What are some of the application use cases? And I think about, for example, the goggles that we just saw from Apple and how that might be the future of computers, of the personal computer. What are you envisioning in terms of the archetype of what we should be looking for to understand the companies that are going to benefit both on the hardware of it as well as the software? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, look, I think 
whatever use cases we can imagine for generative AI, especially as it relates to enterprise software, um, you know, those are going to be very different three to five years from now versus what, what we're seeing today. So, you know, we can only kind of scratch the surface of what's actually going to happen. But I think the bigger thing we have to take a look at when it comes to enterprise software is, you know, you talked about virtual reality as being potentially the future of computing and, and you know, that, that's entirely a possibility. I think generative AI is going to be the primary way in which we interact with software over the next five years, right? It, it, it may take time for that to shift. Um, you know, we all remember what happened when we went from the command line interface to, to GUI, right? When we went from Microsoft DOS to Windows. And I think we're going to see that similar shift. And so when we really want to say, who is really going to be a, a beneficiary of this, right? It's, it's, it, it is absolutely, you know, Microsoft, I think that not only has software solutions that benefit from this, uh, like GitHub Copilot, like, um, you know, OpenAI services on Azure, uh, Office 365, but they also provide the technology that enables others to embrace um, generative AI, right? Especially on the Azure side of the equation, along with some of the hardware, you know, you see that they're working on, on potentially building out a rival uh, to NVIDIA's GPUs, just given how much demand there's going to be. Um, it's, it's hard for me to not see Microsoft as being a beneficiary of this in a big way that I still think is not even priced into the stock today. Now, if we want to go and say who else in enterprise software can, can benefit from this, I really think it's the large platform vendors that have a lot of data, have a lot of history with their customers and have the use cases kind of already sketched out and seem to be moving fast. I would think about companies like Salesforce, companies like HubSpot, companies like MongoDB um, that, that have that roadmap, but also have that, that, that touch points with the customers and their customer data that can really supercharge the way in which customers get value out of their platforms. Rishi, you're talking about how you see why there's a buying opportunity. How do you even start to put valuation figures around some of these names? Do you just buy first and ask later about how this translates into some sort of market valuation? You know, I think that that would be a, a trap if we did that. So fortunately, we're not doing that. We, we are absolutely trying to figure out how to quantify uh, revenue uplift and, and, and ultimately, um, you know, net income or free cash flow uplift because profitability does actually matter at the end of the day. It's not just growth for the sake of growth. And so what we try to think about is, is a couple of things. Um, you know, what, what can this drive in terms of additional monetization and uplift in terms of what you can collect from customers? Uh, what can this uh, uh, lead to in terms of, um, you know, competitive displacements, where can we get some additional efficiencies on, you know, throughout the PL that leads to, uh, you know, additional uh, uh, profitability, um, you know, and, 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 and think about all of those sort of uh, things. And, and that really quantifies what is the ultimate free cash flow uplift at, at the end of the day and how does that plug into our DCF model? So uh, absolutely, we, we try to quantify it. it. It may be too early, it may be a, a little bit, but I think we have to have that framework um, otherwise, if we're just buying something on AI hype, then we end up with situations like companies like Palantir that aren't actually even doing AI. And, you know, the stock has doubled over the past month just on hype, but not even figuring out how does this plug into your model. Rishi, great to catch up. Rishi Jaluri there Thank of you. RBC on the distinction between hype and actually making this happen. NVIDIA, that stock is up by 156% year to date. If you are just tuning in, plenty of disruptions to flights in the last 24 hours connected to the wildfires in Canada and the smog that we've seen come down through the United States, particularly here on the East Coast in the last couple of days. This from the FAA, inbound flights to LaGuardia grounded on low visibility. That headline just coming in, inbound flights time to LaGuardia grounded on low visibility visibility. Flows in the Northeast and particularly on Bloomberg Radio to the South is worse. There's no other way to put it. Central, Southern New Jersey and down to Philadelphia where the numbers are truly unimaginable. There's different ways you measure this, but basically New York City is unhealthy and Philadelphia is hazardous. That's the sort of the language the pros use. So if you are planning to fly this morning, <clears throat> expect perhaps some disruptions. Oh. The latest headline just coming in, Lisa. Inbound flights to LaGuardia grounded on low visibility. And I believe uh, the reports are that it's going to get potentially worse again throughout the day. Remember Is that the report? I didn't see When that. it was, and then it will get better. You nailed as it, it yesterday. As it, as it sort of fades away. I will just say that the emotional impact, especially you talk about your dogs on kids, on other people, you know, people who have already lived yeah. through the pandemic, <clears throat> is pretty significant. We had a school event canceled. The Yankees canceled baseball. Yeah. Philadelphia Phillies, I believe, canceled baseball. You're emotional about the baseball cancellations? That was, no, no. The dreaded Yankees didn't play. That's always a good thing. But, you know, the, the headmaster of the school sent a lovely note just saying we can't do this you know it just 
They're going to have a street thing or something. Are the kids us. happy with that? The kids don't care. I was the kind yeah. of kid who would have like, been happy so with that. Summer. I'd have been thrilled by that. Right. Cancellations. Like so Love summer. that stuff. Do you have homework? Yes. You're going to do it? No. no. Okay, great. Clearly, move on. That's the way <laughs> it works you. at school, isn't it? I feel it in my in the top of my mouth. I, I'm definitely... You can taste it. it. You can taste it. Yeah. I'm here. I hear you. Tang is not helping us. No, I doubt it. Edge Ardenny, if you had any research coming up shortly, he's constructive on this equity market. We'll get to an equity market bull in just a moment. Your equity market right now going absolutely nowhere. From New York, this is Bloomberg. I absolutely think that growth is going to slow from here. You have, we believe, a slowdown coming. Potential recession. Inflation, it's coming down, but it's going to remain elevated. The reality is, is there's just a lot less upside left in this rally and potentially meaningful downside. We do think something else will break between now and year end. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. The smoke-related disruptions continue this morning from New York City. Good morning. Good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bramwitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market just about unchanged on the S&P 500. The latest news in the last 10 minutes or so, the FAA saying that inbound flights to LaGuardia have been grounded on low visibility. Saw a little bit of this yesterday. The FAA slowing flight traffic into some NYC airports, Tom. Saw that in the last 24 hours. I understand that Philadelphia well, International Airport, similar story. Philadelphia, I'm going to suggest worse. Washington, a little bit better. We've got Ed Yardeni coming up. He's 40 miles outside of New York. He's in better shape than we are. It's very variable. Z not zip code to zip code. That's too narrow, but almost county to county. It, there's a real variability here. It's not just like a malaise. <clears throat> I've not got more to say. I no, that's my okay. weather thing. I'm tossing back it. to you so you, right. five day, you. so you can give us a five-day well, forecast. I was, was going to say, it's just been <laughs> phenomenal to experience. <clears throat> phenomenal. You step outside, the eyes are burning. You can taste oh. it in the air. Elisa, we've seen the last couple of days, these wildfires just paint the sky orange here in New York and beyond. It just feels like yet another sort of global crisis hitting the New York City area. And I say this as a native New Yorker. It's just one of those moments where suddenly there's sort of an eerie calm. There's a silence. People aren't exercising <clears throat> outside. People are all wearing masks again. Things right. slow down. And I think that that's kind of a visceral response in addition to burning nostrils I, in the back of your head. I have a new respect for Delhi. I, quick story. I'm in Shanghai. I got to go. they lift this every day? I got to go. Yeah, I go 70 miles outside of Shanghai to a town I can't pronounce in uh, cash flow. I go, what's the town like? And he goes, it's one of China's 14 Pittsburghs. And it's a manufacturing place in that. And in the hotel room, fancy hotel, they had one of the gas masks the weather people in New York are showing right now with the things out to the side. And I've got a new respect here for what Shanghai lives every day with a rating of 80 or 90 or 100 or Delhi at 160 and this morning New York at 223 and Philly worse than that. Hopefully in a couple of days <clears throat> this will pass. That's the latest. If you are just tuning in, the FAA saying inbound flights to the Guardia Airport grounded on so-called low visibility. Just look outside the window right now in New York City and you can see the lack of visibility. Let's get to the broader equity market price action on the S&P 500. Just slightly negative on the S&P, just a touch lower, softer. Yields a bit higher, a whole lot higher yesterday, higher by a single basis point this morning. Lisa, 380.89 on the US 10-year. That really is the theme for me, especially as we look around the world at global yields generally rising in response to a one-two punch from the Bank of Australia and the Bank of Canada, the Reserve Bank of Australia. 8.30 a.m. initial jobless claims. Very much curious to see whether we do see a material tick up. If we don't, how much do people start to price in an active Fed next week that they still are potentially going to raise rates despite the skip, jump, whatever you want to call it, talk? Today, the Bloomberg Invest Conference continues. Our own Tom Keane will be speaking with Nassim Taleb probably around 10.30, 10.35 a.m. Eastern. Don't miss that. Goldman Sachs is John Waldron as well as Katie Koch of TCW. And at 4.30 p.m., a lot of the rate uh, hike discussion really centers around how much the banking crisis is over. Very curious to see that in the data that comes out at 4.30 p.m. with respect to discount lending as well as just generally uh, with respect to the balance sheet that's come in. Want to watch a little bit later on this afternoon. Lisa, thank you. Ed Yardeni joining us now, the president of Yardeni Research. Ed, I've loved the notes over the last couple of weeks. The mother of all melt-ups. Ed, are we closer to a melt-up than a meltdown? 
Well, I think we've definitely had a melt up in the mega cap eight stocks, uh, as as you've been uh, highlighting. Uh, these stocks have uh, kind of taken over the market uh, in uh, recent weeks. I think it really started with the the banking crisis, right? In in uh, March, March eighth or so. Uh, when we started having the banking crisis, the financials took a dive. Even energy took a dive on fears that if the financials are going down, that can't be good for the economy. And the energy stocks went down. Uh, but it, people still wanted to be in the market. And they ran into the mega cap eight because they have cash. They have cash flow. And uh, they have mm. uh, good business. Uh, I think the market's actually going to broaden out back to the financials. Uh, right now, we've got some uncertainty, concerns about whether there might be another rate hike. But I think the economic outlook is still pretty good. And I think that once people get more comfortable with the financials, I think the market will broaden out in that direction. And I want to give a look back here quickly in a victory lap for you. You've had a set of victory laps over a lengthy career. In October, Ralph Ancompora and Edward Yardani said climb on board this bottom in the market. You're up 19 percent from your October low. Right. The triple leveraged Yardani fund, this is something in develop right now, is a 57 percent at return wow. since October. Okay, yeah, that's before Yardani takes out its two and 20. But the answer here, Yardani, I want you to talk to people who missed it. They didn't listen to Ralph Ancampore. They didn't listen to Ben Laidler. They didn't listen to Ed Yardeni. Talk to the people who miss this rally, how they get on board. Well, I'm, I'm still optimistic that uh, the market is going to move higher by the end of the year into next year. I, I think next year is uh, sort of the, the environment that the market is increasingly uh, thinking about discounting. And I think the economy is going to be better. I think earnings are going to be better. Uh, however, uh, we have had uh, a heck of a move, and it's been in these large cap uh, stocks. I think, uh, you know, as I said, look look for where uh, there's been laggards, and there certainly have been laggards in the financial, there have been laggards in energy, even in industrials. Uh, in addition to uh, the, the, the melt-up scenario I've, uh, b uh, for, for, for mega caps, uh, I've also been monitoring the uh, situation for construction in the United States, and it's absolutely booming for non-residential construction, and I think it's about to boom for infrastructure uh, spending. And so I think uh, the industrials are another place to be. You were saying that the 4,600 target that you currently have might be conservative if this all bears out. What do you say to those who push back and say, if that comes to pass and all of the people who are in cash decide it is the time to throw in the towel and go into equities, that will give the Fed more ammunition to hike rates further and kill this off more quickly? Well, I think the Federal Reserve... The federal official, federal reserve officials, have been saying for quite some some time that they want to get the interest rate, the Fed funds rate, up to a restrictive level. I think five five and a quarter percent is proving to be restrictive. Uh, there has been uh, a banking crisis. We have seen uh, uh, surveys of loan officers saying that they are tightening uh, lending standards. So I think they're where they wanted to be, and I think they have to factor in that uh, quantitative tightening. Uh, as well as the tightening of lending standards probably amounts to at least another 50, 100 basis points in effective federal funds rate hikes. So if the funds rate now is five, five and a quarter percent, I think effectively it's already at six, six and a quarter percent. But if that's not enough, Ed, to slow any kind of growth, and you are seeing construction uh, construction companies actually seeing a boom, you're seeing the housing market reignite, you're seeing all shoots of uh, possibly some sort of recovery in manufacturing sectors sure. that have been beaten up. Doesn't this go against the idea that it is enough, that it is restrictive enough to bring about a decline in inflation to the degree that the Fed would like? Well, inflation has been coming down, as you know. Um, maybe it's not coming down as rapidly as as some people think, but uh, I think it's proven to be quite transitory in uh, durable goods and even non-durable goods, where we still have stickiness or persistence is in services. And we know that rent inflation uh, in the real world has come down pretty dramatically, and that's likely to uh, mean that uh, we get down to something like 3 to 4 percent inflation by the end of this year. Uh, right now, we're about 4 to 5 percent. So I'm optimistic that inflation can very well on uh, can come down very well on its own uh, w without any more res restriction. I think a lot of the inflation was pandemic related. It was a shock. There was, have been aftershocks, and I think we're sort of normalizing. And you're Danny, you talk about a broadening market. Help me with yes. packaged goods. Some of them are trading at 19, 20, 21 times uh, earnings. Am I supposed to acquire new sh new shares in those companies? I mean, I. 
I, I'm just dazz dazzled by the idea of buying new shares at a 21 multiple that's got a single digit, slow single digit revenue growth. You know, they, the, the bears have been uh, certainly right about the fact that uh, uh, we we have really never seen a situation where a bull market uh, got started with multiples basically at fair value. Uh, the, yes. the forward PE, the, the forward PE of the S and P 500 was 15.1 on October 12th when the market uh, bottomed. And that, that is uh, troubling to a lot of people. Uh, but uh, the reality is if you take out the mega cap eight, which are unusual stocks, uh, you get a multiple of about 16. So again, it's closer to fair value. Uh, whereas with them, uh, you're at 18, 18 and a half. Uh, so I, I think you have to really kind of slice and dice the, uh, the, the stock market uh, and, and look for where the value is right now. And, uh, as I said, it's the uh, beaten up financials that seem to be pretty good values. Industrials, I don't think, have discounted um, uh, what we're seeing with onshoring and with uh, building uh, chip plants in the United States, electric vehicle uh, battery plants and so on. Uh, so I think there are still opportunities in the market. Great to catch up, Ed. What a call. Just to be constructive so far it's through this year, forever. remains constructive. Ed Yardeni of Yardeni Research, talking up the financials. <clears throat> Check out the post SVB low, what we've done on the NASDAQ, on the S&P 500. On the NASDAQ from the post SVB low, right. NASDAQ 100, 20% gains. On the S&P 500, 10% gains. What are the banks gains. on? You follow it more than I do, but are the banks really, the regionals, are they really still broken a struggle. out? No, still a struggle. No, it's still a struggle. It's been a struggle. Yeah. There's a lot of people, Tom, who just think that at the <clears> moment, they're going to struggle because right. the headwinds around profitability are going to be difficult for the time being. To the weather, 30 minutes ago, the Washington Post Weather Service says Washington is worse than yesterday. That's their language. And they also note to the northeast, to Baltimore, and up to Philadelphia is hazardous, just for those driving, traveling, and thinking of moving today. Do you want a big story? This from the Wall Street Journal just in. This is fascinating. China and Cuba have reached a secret agreement for China to establish an electronic eavesdropping facility on the island. Oh, that will be... That, according to US officials, sort of news familiar with highly classified intelligence. <clears throat> that story out just, I have just moments ago. the memory of my parents hiding the newspapers during the Bay of Pigs. They did not want little Tommy and his sister to see them. To scare you? That was the tension. I, I, I clearly remember feeling the tension, but they used to hide the newspapers. Not, I'm not equating this to Bay of Pigs. I would never sure. do that. But we're in morning TV, so you can do that. You just did. <clears throat> Thank the, you. The Wall Street Journal saying that I'll Cuba the to host secret chair. Chinese spy base <clears throat> focusing on the United States. We've got Anne Marie this hour. We have, I, is she cool. here? Is she in person? Or is she I back? believe she's still she's here. She's going to make an appearance. She hasn't left. Right. And because we've right. got these flight disruptions, she's, yeah, she's maybe doing. she'll never leave. Yeah, she's, maybe she's, she's stuck like in hanging now. with Aaron Judge. I can see she's just, the she just entered the studio. She's like, yeah. Gotta wait for the commercial break, hey, mate. You can't yeah. do that. She went out to the Yankees the rules. to see the game last night. And, you know, she hung out with Aaron for you know hours. Hey, mate, around the table in about five minutes' time. Cities, Kristen Biddley joining <coughs> us in a little bit as well from New York. This is Bloomberg. up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa, Lisa Mateo. Bank of America's chief executive officer, Brian Moynihan, says that higher capital requirements will impact lending, following reports that large U.S. banks may have to boost their capital by an average of 20 percent. The best news about this whole dialogue is the they've got an agreement that extends a period of time, so we shouldn't have to deal with this for a while, which is really critical because the United States has to be the beacon of stability strength in the world. And at times when this discussion is going on and you travel the world, everybody gets fixated on it because the United States is the benchmark of benchmarks. And if it goes completely somehow accidentally, it's a real problem. And so they get all fixated and all this sort of activity into planning for it, what would happen to all our company. It, it just... And it would just be better if it didn't go on. Moynihan spoke with Bloomberg's David Weston at the Bloomberg Invest Conference in New York. Kim Kardashian says she's looking forward to the relationship she's building with the other founders of Sky Partners. I'm honestly most looking forward to my relationships with the founders. I'm really fascinated to hear their backstory. I'm, I'm a storyteller. I, okay. I'm so excited just to have the opportunity to help them win. Kardashian presented her debut private equity fund to a crowd of curious investors in Berlin at the Super Return Conference. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
we've got to address how do we make sure uh, we do everything we can to help Ukraine win, but we also have to make sure uh, that we're not wasting dollars. We're going to have $35 trillion worth of debt uh, in two years. We've got to make sure Germany and France do more than their fair share. Uh, can't just be the American taxpayer that's paying for this. Let's look at lethal aid that's going to help them Ukraine win, not just have another prolonged war that goes on forever and ever. Feels like the latter at the moment for the Ukrainian people, that's for sure. The Senator Rick Scott of Florida on Bloomberg's balance of power just yesterday. From New York City this morning, good morning to you all. Let's check in on the price action on the S&P 500. Equity futures just about negative. Let's call it unchanged at the moment. Yields just about higher by a single basis point, 380, much higher in yesterday's session as we get another surprise rate hike this week. The first from Australia, the second out of calendar. Plenty of surprises out of Canada over the last couple of days. The wildfires paint in the sky the colour orange over the last couple of days, Tom. The latest news from the FAA in the last 20 minutes or so, the inbound flights to LaGuardia have been grounded on low visibility, Tom. They've been slowing the traffic into New York City airports over the last day or so. I think well, with the sun rising, we're going to see a lot more of this. There's no question about it. We saw it yesterday. I believe Newark at one point was uh, limiting incoming. I saw one tweet. I'm not sure the data is that right now Newark glow, uh, across America is 28 minutes delayed incoming, but... Uh, we're going to see much more of this. And, Lisa, you nailed this yesterday, saying it's a movable feast. And as a general statement, it seems to get worse in the afternoon. Am I, is that a theory we can run with here? To be clear, I am not a weather expert. I was just <clears throat> reading the reports that it was saying that it was coming in and settling uh, as the afternoon went on. There is a real question, though, about sort of business disruptions, especially if people are not able to be outside in schools, even cancel some of their events and their classes. I think what's important here, John, uh, and I want you to bring in our next guest. She's so special here. As you get out the map, you get out Google, and you look at Taiwan, and you look at the distance to China, 100 miles, 105 miles, who's counting, whatever, you like straight or moves, Persian Gulf. Sure. And the distance of Cuba, and it can, it can vary here, but it's 260 miles. To You know, it depends which part of Cuba you're looking at. But the answer is that's going to be the equivalency about something that's going to be talked about nonstop today. The story just breaking moments ago from the Wall Street Journal this hour that China and Cuba have reached a secret agreement for China to establish an electronic eavesdropping facility on the island of Cuba. That, according to U.S. officials familiar with highly classified intelligence. MH jumps into the studio, into the hot seat. Good to see you, Anne-Marie. Good to see you guys. What do you make of that? Well, I think it's concerning for the U.S., given the proximity of Cuba to the United States, and potentially what does this mean for China? That means they could potentially monitor things like phone calls, like emails, like satellite transmissions. So, obviously, U.S. officials would be very concerned about this, because this is China exerting more power very close to the U.S. border. Complete unfair question. Does it derail the trip of the Secretary of State to China? I don't think it derails the trip at this moment, because, remember, they are desperate the Biden administration, what it feels like with all of these overtures to in, have invitations to sit down with their counterparts to make sure they are at least does having China dialogue. China sit down with us? I think China does, but they're using this, of course, as leverage. And it's very awkward for China to say yes to some U.S. meetings when, say, there's a new export control ban on them, when they're hearing the G7 in the United States talk about not decoupling exactly, but de-risking, and that they're going to go forward with an outbound investment restriction. So right now, Secretary of State does plan to go. He would be coming, going in the coming weeks. And we should remember, he was always going, even when U.S. officials knew there was a spy balloon flying over continental U.S. The trip got <clears throat> derailed because the optics became so toxic when it became public. Well, this, to me, is one of the most fascinating moments of this political cycle, that Politically, among the people, there is this feeling as hawkish as you can get good on China, right? And then the politicians, particularly the Biden administration, is trying to soften things a little bit to get some breathing room. How much can they fight against that, right? I mean, how much is the Biden losing if they do seem to just sort of shrug off the creation of a secret spy facility in Cuba? Well, this gets very difficult, especially going into 2024, because every presidential nominee who wants to be the Republican candidate is going to be asked about China, and every single one of them is going to be as hawkish as the next. Or you're going to go to the Capitol Hill and talk to those individuals on the China Select Committee who want to be very hawkish. The Biden administration, their actual deliverables on China have been quite hawkish, right? We've seen more from this administration than we've even seen from the Trump administration. The tariffs were kept in place. But at the same time, 
the same time, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone in Washington who's want to take a tough stance on China. You'll also be hard pressed to find anyone that wants to go to war with Beijing. So the Biden administration at least wants to have some sort of dialogue and rhetoric. Look, the two defense chiefs of these two countries couldn't even sit down in a room together. There was a cordial handshake, and then it was back to barbs. Extra headline this morning: Inbound ground stop or delays also possible at JFK and Newark. That coming from the FAA, Tom, just seconds ago. She's got the Gulf Stream. I don't know. She goes out of Teterboro, Middletown <laughs> to the west. I mean, you know, I don't know if it affects the MRE. That's on the latest from the Guardia <clears throat> as well. So if you are just tuning into the program, here's the latest from the FAA this morning just on just some of the potential flight disruptions. Inbound flights to the Guardia grounded again on low visibility. Elisa, just getting an extra headline from the FAA. The inbound ground stop or delay possible at JFK, Newark and Philadelphia as well. This comes as President Biden said that he was actually giving a, a bunch of aid to Emmanuel Macron, uh, not Emmanuel Macron, <laughs> to uh, the, Justin Trudeau, excuse me. They can be uh, easily over, mixed, up, easily for many. mixed yeah, up for many reasons um, there, over, like <laughs> over in uh, Canada <laughs> that he was delivering uh, some <coughs> firefighting aid. Do we have a sense of what kind of effort is being placed on that front and whether that's sort of a lasting effort? So this is what the readout said. It said, to date, the U.S. has deployed more than 600 U.S. firefighters and support personnel. Trudeau then came came out after that phone call and said they expect the U.S. to continue to send some of that some of that support. I don't want to play weather guy, but basically Rob Carolyn says there's a low, a ginormous low off Nova Scotia sitting in the Atlantic that won't move. So, I mean, the fires were there last year, right? The fires were there the year before, et cetera. So maybe it's just a freak low sitting off Nova Scotia. It moves out, John. Life goes on Saturday. You're asking the wrong guy. I, but I just, know, hands up. you know, are we, what are we going to do? Send firefighters up there? We are. We have already what sent are they 600, do? according to the President of the United States. Do they have grizzly bear repellent? I mean, they're going way north, I'm not right? sure. That's definitely out of my bounds of expertise. <laughs> you know, what I going? would say, though, though, is that what's concerning is that <clears throat> meteorologists are talking about the fact that this could happen more. This could be more likely in the future. We right. could see more of these um, fire, fire, uh, forest fires, and it could, right. you know, start to descend, as we're seeing in New York. And actually, Washington, D.C. is going to be much worse today. I'm going to segue here right now on Balance of Power. You'll see this tonight. I've got no doubt about Anne that. Anne Marie, I, I am dazzled by the House. We have 11 ultra conservative Congress people who basically have, have said, on a procedural rule, which I really don't understand, we're going to let the minority Democrats run the House. That's this distillate of a frozen House. Let it go, let it go. Is McCarthy heading out the door based on these 11 ultra-right Congress people? So the ultra-right are not saying we want the minority Democrats to run the show. What they are saying is that we more we want more power and leverage over the they speaker. They don't have power. There's 11 of them. That's not power. No, but what they're saying, and this is what Speaker McCarthy will tell you, is that you know these five to 11 individuals are trying to hold the entire Congress hostage to get what they want out of him. And he had had negotiations with them last night. All of this goes back to potentially what promises were made during the 15 rounds of the speakership early on in the year. And then, of course, all of them, these 11, are very upset with how the debt negotiations went down. They don't think the caps on spending was enough. They <clears throat> want to see more. And at the end of the day, you did have more Democrats, though, this, vote for that than Republicans. So that plays into their hands. Is this Scalise of Louisiana just trying to do an end around McCarthy, <laughs> knock him out the door, and Scalise takes over? I mean, you know, it's like I can, you know, I'm trying to be inside Washington baseball. Help we are not there yet, but I will say this. Punchbowl News did have an interview with Steve Scalise, and how he responded to the current state you have from Jake Sherman is it's not good. He said, I don't know what the promises were. I wasn't part of that. So I still don't know what those agreements were. Whatever they are, conservatives feel is... the agreements were broken. That's got to get resolved. Hopefully it does. Obviously, tale old time and to a tale of old time in Washington. At the number one and number two, obviously there's some friction. This is on the edge it's of the like positively British. It's kind of like John and Tom. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that. Is that what this yeah, is? Yeah. Take why are you surprised? It's politics. I, no, I'm don't not we, surprised. Don't we have with Ryan. We saw with fringe, fringe Democrats running the White House. Hasn't that been an argument for the last two years? No, I don't. I think oh, you there's don't a wide think understanding. That. I, I think there's a lot of people who believe that in Washington, D.C., there are fringe Democrats <clears throat> that are basically in charge of who gets hired to the White House, who gets, who gets hired into the government and this administration. That is, that is a thinking amongst many in Washington, D.C., especially in during the first two years of the Biden administration, obviously you're going to see him want to move very much so to the center. Aaron Judge is still in recovery mode. Hopefully 
will be beating the Red Sox on Friday. Mm -hmm. August 20th, I can get you tickets for New York Red Bulls versus DC United for $25 each. You go a couple of weeks later, August 26th against Inter Miami. And those tickets, Tom, those tickets start at several hundred Great. US dollars. Great. The difference that one man can make <clears throat> to a sport Somebody in America. Somebody once told me, when you see these kind of announcements, just the gate helps pay for it. Just you know, amazing. Their piece they get on the action. Is Just amazing. Of course, well. we're discussing Lionel Messi going to <clears throat> explain, into Miami. It, it, it take a moment here and explain not why he's the best guy in the world, but why he's still so dominant at his age. Is he at the? Is he like when Beckham came over here or Wayne Rooney, where he's older and? No, he's older. Than... It's coming towards the end of his career. He's slowed down. He's not as prolific <clears throat> in front of goal. But clearly, he's going to be the best player in this league, because the. The gap in terms of talent between what happens in Europe and what happens here is still incredibly wide and they're trying to build the game. He's just an incredibly talented football player and you could see it as soon as he burst into the team at Barcelona as a teenager. Oh, yeah. I, I remember mean, seeing it. We I all know. saw yeah. it. There are certain players that come along, they step onto the field, you watch the way they move, the way they receive the ball, the confidence they have, <clears> the way they move towards goal. You know, sometimes, Tom, players burst into a team, they get the ball, they're scared of it, and they pass it back immediately. This guy, this guy was nothing like that. You just knew almost immediately that he was special. Just like that, the, just one touch the on the ball. The money that's going into this transaction, is it money looking for an international exposure or an American exposure? Both. Both. And I would say more so in the United States to begin with. We've done this experiment before with Pelé back in the 70s. Did it with Beckham in the last 20 years. Yeah. This is different, though. It seems to be building on everything we've seen over the last couple of decades. You think about the deal that Michael Jordan did with Nike all those years ago, which I have to say that Matt Damon and Ben Affleck have done a wonderful <coughs> job putting it into a movie over the last 12 months, Tom. Cost you think me about the profit-sharing deal, the revenue-sharing deal they did with Nike and selling <coughs> sneakers. Just the very idea that now we might have that, reportedly, according to The Athletic this morning, we might have that with Apple TV. They sell these season right. passes for Major League Soccer, and you might have this profit sharing agreement with Lionel Messi. That's how big he could be to subscriptions to the game, which is why I also bring up the ticket prices this morning, Bramo, because that's the difference he can make. You can charge $25 at a gate, or you can charge several hundred just with one player joining the roster. The Taylor Swift effect. I mean, Big basically, this is, a, this is a rock star coming and going to make it uh, a really significant thing. So what I find doing. interesting is that this is competitive with the Middle East money that's been coming into the sport. And this is a direct <clears throat> rebuff, uh, rebuff, really, to them saying, we'll pay you $400 million to come on board with us, saying, no thanks, I want to have a stake in this. Adidas might have a move to bank here as well. I'm going to get the details of this in the next couple of days, the incoming weeks as well. And at least at your point, we'll work out just how prolific this deal could be for him both from Apple, from Adidas, and that's before we even get into to wages from into Miami, whatever they are. Yeah, and but at this point, though, how much is it interesting to you? And I'd ask you, because I am no expert in this whatsoever, but David Beckham running this team, that the two of them are teaming up to kind of create a new uh, dominant in this, in this field. Well, part of his deal when he first came over here was at the end of his career that he would have access to buying a franchise in America. So we're kind of building on what happened with Pelé, building what happened with Beckham, and then Messi, and you wonder where it goes from here. I mean, I'm a romantic when it comes to sport. I wanted to see him back at Barcelona. It's a shame that didn't happen. But clearly <clears> he's come <throat> towards the end of his career and, and wants to do something new and build a new legacy. That's the football stuff. We're going to catch up with Alex Webb a little bit later on Apple. I think that deal with Apple TV is something we all need to take a closer look at and what that could mean for sports going forward. If you're LeBron James and you think you're it in the, the NBA, you're Aaron, you're Aaron Judge at the New York Yankees, and you think you're it. Do you want a share of that kind of stuff as well? I'm sure some people do. Equities right now on the S&P 500 look a little something like this on the S&P. Futures slightly negative on both the S&P and on the Nasdaq as well. Into the bond market just quickly, two-year, 10-year, 30-year yields up yesterday off the back of the surprise rate hike from the Central Bank in Canada. 3.80 on 10s, 4.56 on a two-year. And in Europe, well, I call it a recession. I know some politicians don't like to call it that, but two consecutive quarters of negative growth in the Eurozone just and 
just about for Q4 and Q1, the Euro lease, are just north of 107, 107.35. I love the, the recession or not recession discussion. In the single mover name, I'm really curious about what we've seen over the past few sessions, which is the smaller regional banks. We have seen a revival of them in a pretty significant way. If you look at the KBW regional banking index, it's up 22 percent since May 11th. And you could see right now Western Alliance up almost 2 percent, <coughs> PacWest up about 4 percent, U.S. Bank Corp along for the ride. Just interesting, again, that people are talking about rate hikes, people are talking about the potential for more dynamism, and people are writing off the banking crisis. Also, just to stick on sport, Manchester United shares, if you take a look at those, uh, oh, they are you. popping as a result of the fifth bid from Qatar's Sheikh Jassim. It's been going on coming forever. Out. It's been going on forever. They were up a lot more earlier. They're up 2.3 percent. I wonder how much this is Man City's wins basically coming in, oh, people so getting you. really sort of negative on them. How does Manchester United push back against it? I mean, this is really the story as the Middle East and, and frankly, oil money comes in and dominates a lot of the major sport in a big way. I think there's a hope from both shareholders and Manchester United fans alike that they take the highest offer and they get rid of the club. And I'm talking about the Glazers of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, right? There's a hope that they just step away. There was a fear that they hold on to some kind of minority stake and hang around. And this one's been dragging on for months. I've been waiting for the conclusion for this for a long time. I can guarantee you one thing. We will get jobless claims in about an hour. Coming up in about 55 minutes from now, looking ahead to next week, CPI <coughs> data on Tuesday, ahead of the Fed decision on Wednesday. Christina Campmany of Invesco weighing in on some of this, saying, we believe the more optimal and palatable path for the Fed is actually to hike in June and then more clearly communicate they're comfortable with the level of restrictiveness at this point and want to wait a full quarter to access incoming data. So, Tom, it's kind of data <coughs> dependent, but but not sort of data dependent over three months instead of every month. And to recalibrate here into July and to the end of the year, given the mysteries out there, Christina Katmany joins us now. Senior Portfolio Manager, Global Debt at Invesco. And the note, it's not that your note is ambiguous, you're just waiting for the data to come in like everybody else. Do you manage now for coupon or for total return? I think with the Fed, look, they've they've changed their messaging, and we've always kind of been in the camp that I think the 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 bar is for them to go in June unless data changes, and I think the messaging in the last two weeks <clears throat> has shifted that, and I think the message is that in some sense it is more palatable, especially if you look from a global central bank, because as much as the Fed doesn't want to be the central bank for the globe, in some sense they are, and especially for these emerging market central banks who have moved pr proactively and moved early and want to adjust, they feel like they're handcuffed but, by but the what Fed. Is the, what is the duration so, of that on price up or price down on global debt? Yeah, so I think treasuries kind of look fair here. Um, I think it's a range-bound market. I think what looks interesting in the U.S. is actually tips. Um, real yields, five-year real yields are at 170. I think that looks interesting both, like we don't, view this hard landing deep recession camp, but it actually should perform in that environment <clears throat> as well. And now at 170, I think that provides a good place to park some duration because we have moved a lot. We are closer to the end of the Fed cycle than the beginning. How disruptive would it be if the Fed did not skip and they actually raised rates next, next week? I, again, I think that is, in some sense, the more palatable option. A week ago, we were priced for that. And this change in language from pause to skip and trying to communicate that a pause isn't a permanent on hold and cuts are imminent. Um, but I think it's more disruptive for them to not go in June and go in July. You have five or six weeks of data. You don't have materially more information on what's happened tightening wise from the banking sector. You have one payroll and one CPI. Like, do you really have a lot more context about the market in that period of time? I, I, that's hard. Does it make sense to you to both see the Fed hiking next week and also be bullish on credit here, be bullish on risk, be bullish on the idea that this economy has momentum, even if it means the Fed's going to be more aggressive? In terms of is the Fed bullish on credit and risk Whether or is you the, or the market? So I, I think for us, the last nine months, and maybe almost we're approaching a year, the market has imminently looked for this slowdown in growth, slowdown in the consumer, a look for payroll, job creation to imminently fall off. And we haven't <coughs> seen that. The consumer has been robust. Um, and I think what we, we find is in a 
easing cycle that passes through to the market much more quickly than it's passing through in a hiking cycle. Mm -hmm. So there are lags and we need to be able to transition from just looking at concurrent data to assessing these lags. And I think, again, it still is this data dependent. And Jonathan, you've said this before, like saying it's data dependent is silly. It's always data dependent, of course. But are you basically saying that it's too soon to go into some of the higher risk securities? So when we look, we would prefer macro risks rather than um, credit product. And I think like within the credit product, mortgages look interesting because of where they are. And there's a short rate vol bias. We'd be more biased up in credit within credit, so IG over high yield. But I think the more compelling lever that we see are the macro levers and probably FX the most over rates even. The the reality for our listeners and our viewers is not a lot of data dependent, uh, forward looking by strategists and all that. The reality is they're down 17% from the good times in bonds and they've come back maybe 6%. We had somebody in the other day that said 80 is the new par. Mm -hmm. Do we need to reset our bond view thinking that we're not going to get back to the glory that we knew a number of years ago in price? Yeah, I think I think it's a different world. I think we're in a world with higher inflation and we've reset. And I don't think the the 30 year, 35 year bond rally that we had in, in one direction. I got to make some news like, here this morning. Is a 35 year bond rally dead? It, I think we're in a different environment. I think there, the risk is that inflation is here to stay in a more meaningful way. And, and that doesn't mean the 8%, 10% inflation. We've obviously come down and we have CPI next week, but we're still talking, even if you're talking 0.3 risk or 0.5 versus the 0.4 consensus, you're still running at 5% headline and 5.5% core. Like, that is not the Fed's goal. Above target inflation, here to stay for a while maybe. Christina Campmany of Invesco, really revealing, listening to the former Fed Vice Chair Richard Clowder this week <coughs> over in Newport Beach, California, catching up with him at PIMCO talking about accepting two point something. That's a real change, talking about accepting two the point something. something. The something word, two point X. Whatever the something might be, and just <clears> sitting there and well, saying, this is where we are, we want to get back towards two, but just carry on forecasting we're going to get back towards two without actually being back at two. They had a brilliant symposium at the Dallas Fed, I'm going to say 10 years ago for John Taylor, and it's real simple. First of all, it's not 2%, it's 1.X% is where we've been. So you blow through two, and if you get declared as new level, you're a stick above at two point, you know, two point six, two point eight. Is that where we're heading? That's a huge debate. I remember the morning last year, Matt Lazzetti of Deutsche Bank <clears throat> comes out early and calls for a U.S. recession, and he hasn't changed that call since. We'll talk about the date, the magnitude of it. We'll catch up with Matt in about 50 minutes' time from New York. This is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word i'm lisa mateo some 230 square miles of ukraine's southern Kherson region is underwater two days after the destruction of the kohovka dam the regional governor says almost a third of the flood zone where thousands are being evacuated is held by ukrainian forces while the rest is in russian occupied territory Kyiv is assessing the humanitarian economic and ecological damage of the disaster that western leaders denounced as a war crime Uber Technologies wants to cut emissions to zero by converting its entire fleet of cars to electric by 2040. But to do so, Uber CEO says the ride-hailing giant will need support from both drivers and riders. Teslas are the highest selling cars in in terms of electric vehicles by mile. At the same time, we're not, you know, we want electrification to happen. Uh, And that's not just going to happen with Tesla. You know, we need Fords out there, GMs out there, Toyotas out there, et cetera. We need all these other players to go electric. President Biden has vetoed a bill initiated by congressional Republicans that was designed to repeal the administration's student debt cancellation plan. Biden's executive action would forgive up to $20,000 in federal student loans for some borrowers. But the battle is far from over as his plan still faces justices in the Supreme Court. Global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg.
one conviction view that we have is this higher for longer narrative globally. And we're talking about potentially you know, no cuts from major central banks at all until at least the second half of next year. Wow. Whereas, you know, that is not something that's priced in, I would say, the Fed or anywhere globally it's because it's sticky inflation. Persistent inflation and fiscal is only going to make that worse. And we've got quite a few elections you know, coming up globally over the next 18 months as well. And we love electoral giveaways on the fiscal side, don't we? What an amazing conversation with Jeff Yu there, senior market strategist at BNY Mellon. The electoral risk around fiscal policy and that risk, that risk is something the central bankers might have to be focused on in the coming 18 months or so. From New York, welcome to the programme. Flight delays expected across airports in the New York City area, including in Philadelphia as well. Look out for that across the country. The latest news a little bit earlier this morning that flights were grounded at LaGuardia. Plenty more news since then. Elsewhere in the market, not much news to talk about, I have to say, at the headline level on the S&P 500, just a little bit softer. Continuation of yesterday, just a little bit in the bond market, yields higher by a single basis point, 380.70 on the US 10 years. Surprise rate hikes this week, Australia, Canada. Tearing us up for next week, will we get a surprise out of the Federal Reserve? The Federal Reserve and Chairman Powell does not like to surprise. Let's see if um, they do just that next week. City's <coughs> Andrew Hollenhorst is sticking with it, still thinks a hike next week. Let's see if they drop that call or stick with it after CPI on Tuesday morning. One story <coughs> we need to discuss this morning, though, Tom, is just this phenomenal deal between Little Messi, one of the greatest, if not the greatest player ever in football, and Major League Soccer and into Miami. A single, into, into Miami. A single sentence here for those that really don't follow this. And, you know, the kids walk by me with the Argentinian shirt on, the white and blue stripes, and I guess I get it. But I don't. You mentioned Paley earlier. That was from another time and place. Multiple sources involved in or briefed said earlier this week that the American Soccer League and Apple have discussed offering Mr. Messi a share of the revenue generated by... I can't believe the detail. New subscribers to the MLS season pass, the streaming package on Apple TV Plus. You mentioned this before, but to see the language, John, that's amazing. More shocking. They've got a $2.5 billion <clears throat> 10 year deal with Major League Soccer. I'm talking about Apple TV. And clearly they think this can go some way to generating and, and real subs. It's a whole new world after all, because, I mean, banning was, uh, betting was banned until a number of years ago now, and in baseball pregame, they're literally giving you the odds of how badly the Red Sox will lose in a given night. We need to talk about the business of this. <clears throat> you can do that with Alex Webb over in London. He joins us from Bloomberg in the city. Alex, let's start here and focus on the business. How big is this deal for Lionel Messi, and what kind of precedents are we setting here? Well, I, we should say they haven't actually signed a deal yet. They, it's almost like an MOU, right? They ex intend to sign a deal. They're working out the details. But, yeah, the reports are not only that Apple um, could do some sort of revenue sharing deal on the new subs that come to the MLS uh, ticket pass that they offer Apple TV Plus, also through Adidas, which is already the, the boot sponsor for, uh, for Messi himself, that they might also do some sort of revenue split. They make all the jerseys in the MLS. It is potentially a massive deal if he gets a slice of all that. There has sort of been precedent for this before. When Beckham joined the MLS 15, 16 years ago, he got the opportunity to buy a franchise, uh, to get the franchise rights for 20, I think $25 million was reported at the time at an undefined future date. <clears throat> when he finally did it, a decade later, franchise rights were selling for uh, $300 million. So he automatically converted a 25 million stake you know, tenfold. So they are quite canny in the MLS at finding ways of attracting these big players without massively breaking the, the salary caps that some of these teams have. There's a distinction here, though, with Apple, with this idea that one of these streamers, one of the distributors of the sport, is having an active role in helping foster who will be playing on the field, who will be in their roster. How much is that going to be something of a template versus a one-off for some of the streaming services that want to get in on the sport that is capturing the eyeballs and possibly the one thing keeping afloat the traditional sort of uh, plug-in media. I think Messi's pretty much an exceptional case, as John quite rightly said. Many will argue he's the greatest <clears throat> player of all time. I think that a lot of other people would struggle to say, I want the same deal as Messi, and it might be laughed out the room. What you might see is in other sports, right? In other sports where streamers have rights, whether it's UFC, whether it's something else, that they will try to get a, a chunk of the gross. Right. 
also that they might make um, little documentaries. They might make a documentary about a given player that then also gives them a cut of some streaming dollar. You know, <coughs> Apple TV Plus has got a messy documentary that 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 Kali Messi himself is benefiting from. So. There's a slice of a template there. I don't think anyone else is going to be getting exactly this. Uh, Alex, uh, James Nolton over at The Guardian did a nice summary, I'll say two months ago, of the how MLS in America just really hasn't cut through. Do you look at this, and, and I mean this within all of the Alex Webb media analysis you do, is this just rich guys playing, or is there a legitimate league out there that people will care about? I think... MLS is starting to reach an inflection point. Like, I did some analysis a few months ago where you're looking at that franchise value, and actually, if the pace at which the, the franchise rights value is accelerating, you tally that against the pace at which rights in, in NHL, which is historically the kind of fourth, the biggest major league in the US right. sports, MLS is on track to overtake it within the decade, right? So it is really starting to... to uh, bite at nibble at the heels of NHL. NHL is still quite a bit bigger, has more games. That obviously helps it. But this is this is a real business. John, and, and like, yeah. and one final thought on this is that unlike other football soccer leagues, because there's no relegation or promotion, there's a revenue sharing, there's broadcasting sharing pretty evenly. It is a lot safer an investment than buying, for example, Manchester United, right? Because you have a far better visibility did, into the earnings profile in a few years' time. Did Alex Webb just announce that Manchester United is getting relegated next year? I he did. That's what he alluded he, he to. He didn't go that what far. What are your thoughts on this, John? Look, I think what we're seeing across <clears throat> sport, we're witnessing that these guys aren't athletes, they're content providers. And a great example of that over the last couple of years has been Liberty Media buying Formula One and what they've managed to do. On Netflix and what you're seeing is Apple view Messi not as an athlete but as someone who can provide content for them that they can sell and Messi's got to sit there and say you know what I want a slice of that so what I'm here if I'm gonna bring you revenue and that's the way sport has changed okay, much but... more so in the last few years think of Ryan Reynolds buying Wrexham he didn't see that purchase as owning a football club he saw it as a way of providing content from a streaming service Amazon who's gonna pay him money so you agree, to create content you agree with Alex that this is not rich guys playing, that there's a legitimate future for this league that 99% of our audience MLS, doesn't care about. Yeah. This isn't the same as Saudi money at all. Okay. Not at all. The Saudi issue with the Saudi government, that's a PR story, that's about soft power, that's about sovereign states yeah. getting a foothold in, well, in very popular <clears throat> sports. I think what you're seeing in MLS in this deal between Lionel Messi and potentially Adidas and Apple, a building on the legacy of what Michael Jordan did with sneakers, yet we're doing this well, now for global media. And I'll say it again, Tom, we're doing it with Formula One, we're doing it with Wrexham and Ryan Reynolds, and we're doing it potentially right. with Apple and Lionel, Lionel Messi. Cheers to everybody on radio and TV who had family watch the Air Jordan movie, and then, of course, we had How to go out and that? buy How Air great Jordan was that? movies. We had to buy two pair of Air Jordans. How cool was that? Oh, it was great. Loved the movie. It was great. really, really quite good. Building on the legacy of Michael Jordan's mother, who had the foresight to ultimately push for that deal. Well, this, you know, to be honest with Alex Webb, this seems like a shift much like what Mrs. Jordan accomplished. You know, it's a different... In potentially dialogue. bigger and more complicated ways. Alex, thank you. <clears throat> Alex Webb there of Bloomberg he Quick Take like, you know, on should, the latest. He's not a contributor. He should, Alex Webb should just like be on Daily. I mean, he's like, we can come on, Daddy. What would you like there? him to discuss? Just um, anything. I... You know, do just, TK roulette. You just, just spin the wheel. Top, sums it, you know. Whatever it lands on. He just does a, you know, Nvidia. And... Do, 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 do. It's like the show sometimes. <laughs> you know? yeah. TK roulette. Just spins the wheel. Whatever it lands on. It's in the zeitgeist. Hey, right Emery nailed the Red Sox Yankees series coming up. What a train wreck this, that's going to be. This weekend is that even happening anymore? What's going on with <laughs> well, that? Well, that's a serious question. You've right. seen the weather, the weather changes here. I mean, uh, um, I don't even know what a ground stop is. FAA cancels ground stop at LaGuardia. I think that's where they're like out on the runway, sitting there. I don't know. Just the, you know. the plane's grounded. Yeah, I don't that's, know. That seems it's to be like the way that works. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Kristen Bidley, a city, bumping into each is going to join us on her mid-year outlook next.
I think the recession story is frankly off the table at this point. We're not going to have a recession here, but we are in an asset price recession. I'm just not convinced that we are going to be able to see growth with the kind of resilience that we're seeing now. The economy actually in the US remains on a very robust footing at the moment. At the moment, the US is not our favorite region. But if you're looking at over a 10-year period, do you want to be focused on the U.S. or Europe? Well, it's 100% U.S. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, in difficult weather conditions in New York City. We're monitoring the airports, of course, this, this fire, the fumes, the smoke that we've had come in through the day. And we will stay focused here in this hour on claims at 830 and far more on the state of the market. John, mid-year outlooks are out. We're overwhelmed with 40-page Beautiful documents about what to do forward. Overwhelmed and beaten up by the last six <clears throat> months. Just a bunch of I'll consensus say. views shredded. You mentioned the dollar. the dollar. Weak dollar. Take it's going to happen. China, it's Europe dollar. outperforming. Tech's going to be bad. Tech absolutely <laughs> ripped. Hello, NVIDIA. Don't own Apple. Hello, Meta. Hello, Apple. Take your pick. And now we've got surprises this week. Australia, Canada. What does the future hold for the Federal Reserve? That statement from Governor Macklin, do we get the same thing from Chairman Powell in six months' time after announcing a conditional pause that they have to restart interest rate hikes because we're not sufficiently restrictive? That's why some people were spooked yesterday. I thought yesterday was there, and we, in the opening of the show, you saw the many divergent opinions that, that we had here, and we're going to really address this head-on with J.P. Morgan Private Bank here in a moment. But to me, John, given the view to the Fed, it's for the people on the sidelines. How do you get into the game Oof. if you've missed this? Comfortable in cash at 5%. Still comfortable in cash Didn't at 5%. Didn't listen to Ed Yardeni in October. I'm still comfortable in cash at 5%, and then... <clears throat> It goes higher. Yeah. It goes higher. And all of a sudden, you've missed out on a 30% right. rally on the NASDAQ and 100% plus on Meta and NVIDIA. We've got Ira Jersey scheduled to release a brief us on 5% T-bills. I mean, it's just a whole uproar right now that we're all going to die in the next 90 days. Is there? Because there's like the debt crisis is over and T-bills are going to do this or do that. I mean... That was the narrative that died on Monday. I think that people came Monday. into the uh, week I'm saying that potentially we could get a real sucking sound of liquidity out of the market because of the T-bill sales. And then people said we really just had nothing else to talk about. I mean, if you really talk to them quietly. So people have kind of right. put that storyline aside. There is this larger <clears> issue, though. Everyone has moved on from some of the stresses of the fact that bank deposits cost something and that people are now going into uh, T-bills and going out of those deposit accounts. The lack in lending is just really unclear right now, and people don't have a sense of what that slow-moving train really looks like. That's a two-part economy. We've had some guests here that have really talked about, you know, Marilyn Watson at BlackRock was talking about a pretty buoyant America. And others, John, there's a huge set of gloom out there. Maybe it's centered around housing and the oddities of the mortgage rate, but there's a lot of gloom out there right now. I see it in the the, the buying of puts, the, the betting on markets going down. It's, I had a nice back and ginormous. forth yesterday with the economist, the one-man <clears throat> economist on right. Wall Street, and just said, you know, the post-pandemic distortions are still here. Yeah. We pulled full forward demand of physical things. We're all trying to buy stuff. Right in a pandemic, pushed out demand for services, still witnessing that demand for services right now, re-engaging with things like flying, tourism, TK, no sign of that slowing down yeah. anytime soon based on what the airlines have been telling us. I'll be with Nassim Taleb here in about two hours with Bloomberg Invest as well. We'll talk there about the black swans that are out there right now. John, I don't even know where to begin on the data check. I'm going to go to a near 4% 30-year bond. Haven't talked much about it, but once again, yields rising and out in the distance 4% beckons. We should also go to the importance of round numbers <coughs> on SBX, on the S&P 500. Apparently, we don't like 4,300. We like 4,299 but can't hold that for very long. 42.99.19 yesterday, higher the session. Monday, 42.99.28, higher the session. Can we break 43? Ed Giardini, 4,600. I know. I Tony know. Dwyer, 2,200. Did you I'm work kidding. that out? Did you work I'm that kidding. out? No, we were doing math with Tony Dwyer, folks. He didn't want to give us a point estimate. I've, was it 11 times earnings on what? I, I forget what the earnings number was. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 
last time he's on the show. 11 times earnings was a joke, by the way. Just, you know, anyway. What we're going to do right now is move on. We'll continue to give you airline headlines as they come out, given the really horrific conditions on the West Coast. Philadelphia hit hardest. But right now, and this is really important, on radio and television, if you want to know at the margin where to allocate next, listen carefully to Kristen Bitterly, head of North America Investments at City Global Wealth. We're thrilled she could join us today. There's a buried sentence in the usual blather of a mid-year outlook that you released today, which is, are you playing defense or are you being on the sidelines? That is a perfect metaphor for the emotion right now. I think that's exactly right. There's this feeling out there that you're either all in or all out of the market that I think you guys were talking about this earlier on the program, this idea that you're either all in T-bills and sitting in that 5% or somehow you're chasing and finding a defensive play in tech stocks. And so what we've done, and this is something that we've done from the very beginning of the year, is we've actually been very balanced in terms of our fixed income portfolios, our equity portfolios, where we are fully invested, but we're picking our spots in those asset classes in terms of quality. And when you look at the performance of something like that year to date, it's actually high single-digit returns for a balanced portfolio. It's not the 25% of the NASDAQ, but it's certainly strong returns year-to-date. Stan Druckenmiller was great yesterday with Shanali Basak. He talked about the prospect of going into recession and compared almost staples to what's happening with AI <coughs> and NVIDIA. Can I compare, can I put in the same bucket some of these tech names with consumer staples? I, I, I would love to hear that in more detail. I think that would be a challenging analysis to do. But I think when we talk about what's happened within the market more broadly, I do think this concentration, and everyone's talking about this, this is not a new story about the breadth in the market. The breadth in the market, those seven stocks representing more than 100% of the gains, even if you look, it's not a uniquely U.S. story. That's a global story as well, that there's 10 companies representing 85% of the global gains. And so what does that tell me? It actually tells me that the market is pretty rational. Where the money has been going into has been these mega cap companies with strong free cash flow generation, the ability to fund growth, not dependent on credit markets, have their balance sheets in order, and a lot of them have raised guidance going forward. So, so given that, right, <coughs> given that maybe there's rationality, but maybe you don't want to play that because you can't really predict the AI future, are you starting to now say that the rational plays of, say, regional banks, of, say, just generally financials, areas that have gotten beaten up? are looking good again if things aren't that bad. That's one of the <clears throat> themes in our outlook is actually this coming rotation within equities. So as I mentioned earlier, we have been playing defense. We've been invested in areas like global dividend growers, but some of the areas that we've been eyeing and, and adding um, adding exposure, so something like mid-cap, right? So looking at mid-cap and the valuation um, differential, trading at about a 28% discount to larger cap, looking at some of those themes, you have to be selective. This isn't just kind of a broad brush. You want profitable companies just like you want profitable companies um, in large cap. But that's an area when people ask the question, has this theme gotten away from me? You can actually find opportunities just going down the cap structure. One thing we've been talking about throughout the morning is the weight of people who have been hiding in T-bills to go into NVIDIA, to go into big tech, to look for those double-digit returns that you were talking about and not be happy with single-digit returns, even if they look pretty pretty good on a risk-adjusted uh, level. You've been traveling a lot, talking with clients. What do they say? How much pressure are you hearing to get a little bit more with respect to earnings? I think everyone is asking that question of, is tech a buy? Should I continue to chase this rally? And I think one of the most interesting things, bringing it back to the AI conversation, because we have to, right? That's just the dominant conversation right now. I think there are fabulous companies out there, but they're valued at, you know, an even more extreme level. And so in terms of making money in any type of market, it's really that differential. And so some of the areas that if you think of the net beneficiaries of AI, the concentration has really been in those mega cap companies. But then when you look at areas like cybersecurity, that's going to have to come along for the ride. Areas like one of our long term term unstoppable trends is investing in longevity, a net beneficiary of this technology where you haven't seen that type of valuation, and you haven't seen the funds really come into those areas, those are ways to be invested, but not in a pure play. Just quickly, what's special about 4,300? On the S&P. I don't think anything special about 4,300. What is it about I, I getting actually, into 4,299 yeah. this week and just stopping there and pulling back? 
I I think, look, I think the major conversation is once we hit that 20% um, appreciation level and this idea that all of a sudden it would turn into a true bull market, I think we have to look at whether you're in the camp of higher for longer in interest rates or you're in the camp that we could see a cut at the end of this year. If there is some type of recession, ultimately, and some type of, it has to signal that we're going to see further contraction within earnings. And that's something that I think the outlook right now is a little bit too rosy. We actually, that was one thing coming into this year, we thought we were going to see about a 10% percent contraction in earnings. We've reduced that. We think it's about going to be about a 6% based on the strong Q1, but still a contraction. This conversation is of 15 years ago. I'm not used to a normal conversation that was in Fabozzi or in, you know, the CFA curricula. I mean, it's it's shocking to hear this. It's like, oh, a normal conversation after 15 years of oddity. We're all recalibrating 15 that. years of zero rates, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah. and there was no risk-free rate. The sharp ratio didn't right. work. I mean, it's all there is to it, and we all made it up as we uh, went. And what's so important here, John, is all the focus of the media, the financial press, is on short covering, a short squeeze, convexity to the upside, stuff I don't even understand. And you know what it's about? The bitterly world, the, you know, the, the David Kelly world, which is the basic idea, do you have the courage to get off the sidelines? That's the heart of the matter. The cash trap. Yeah. It's been a feature of the show for the <clears throat> last few weeks. Kristen, thank you. Thank you. Kristen Bidley, the City Global Wealth Management. Just the latest on the East Coast air crisis, and I think we can call it that over the last couple of days. So here's our latest, that this blanket of heavily polluted air covering much of the eastern coast of this United States, Tom, likely to linger until Tuesday. It's a bombshell. This is a real adjustment here, and this is from the authorities, the U.S. Weather Protection uh, Group over at uh, NOAA, N-O-A-A, and the answer is these are the pros in the room. They've got all the to tools, all the whiz-bangs, and Zach Taylor over there and others extend this out from the Saturday-ish talk out to Tuesday. They say there'll be elements of less or more, but all of a sudden, we need to reframe this to Tuesday. Expecting some flight cancellations today, some delays <laughs> across airports in New York City and beyond over to Philadelphia as well, so look out for some of that. I just caught at the corner of my eye, Matt Lazzetti at Deutsche Bank walking into the building. We're going to catch up with him around <clears> this table in about 20 minutes' time. In the next hour on Bloomberg TV, on the open, Seth Carpenter of Morgan Stanley, Colin Martin, Charles Schwab, Amanda Lynham of BlackRock. All of that coming up shortly from New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The Federal Aviation Administration says inbound flights in LaGuardia Airport have been grounded due to poor visibility, and further ground stops are also possible at JFK, Newark, and Teterboro. Now in Philadelphia, the region faced the worst air quality in the U.S. early today as the impact ripples south. Large swaths of the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic experience unhealthy levels of pollution, while the National Weather Service warned of deteriorating conditions into Alabama and Georgia. And President Joe Biden offered additional support to fight those blazes as the effects of the smoke blanketed some of the cities with an apocalyptic tinge, forcing officials to urge residents to stay indoors. New York State planned to distribute a million N95 masks on today. Now, the Federal Aviation Administration continued to report flight delays due to low visibility. And Twitter co-founder and former CEO Evan Williams and one of the most critical members of the founding team, Jason Goldman, had a few words about the direction of their former company. They spoke with Bloomberg about Elon Musk's takeover and how the brand will survive. I think that's hard. I think brand recovery is much harder. And now the brand is very linked to Elon. Should it be a company? Yeah. Should the internet be a company? No. And guess what? Anyone can make a new Twitter or a better Twitter or a, like just a whole new paradigm on the internet. And lots of people are trying right yeah. now. And that's really cool. They also spoke more about Silicon Valley's new era of austerity and the future of social media. Global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. We are at the beginning 
of a very classic late cycle, late big cycle debt crisis when the supply demand gap, when you're producing too much debt and you have also a shortage of buyers. Ray Dalio of Bridgewater and, of course, the founder there, I should say. He's in some levels of retirement. Maybe he'll uh, help the New York soccer team compete with Messi in Miami here. Ray Dalio at the Bloomberg Invest Conference. And I really want to say that coming out of the pandemic with all the opportunities of getting people together, it's an extraordinary uh, in uh, Bloomberg Invest Conference. Mr. Druckenmiller yesterday making global headlines, moving the markets. Today, there's a guy from Goldman Sachs that'll wander by, Mr. Waldron. Katie Koch will join from TCW, the West Coast powerhouse. And in the middle, I am thrilled that I will speak to my good, good friend, Nassim Taleb, now of Universa. Scott Patterson's killed it with Chaos Kings. This is the book. Uh, you know, I may launch it to the book of the summer here. Still not too late for that. But this is outstanding on Spitznagel and uh, Taleb as well. Can't really say enough about it. We're going to dive into that in our seminar. I believe radio and TV are going to cover that. They're also going to cover here, with the market's negative three, the bond market. And our bond panel of the last two days will be led by Ira Jersey, chief U.S. interest rate strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, and joins Lisa and I uh, this morning here. I want to get to the OMG, we're all going to die, Ira. <laughs> and that is not messy in Miami. We'll see if we have time for that. It's T-bills after the debt crisis. There's going to be an overwhelming flood of T-bills, and the money market funds won't sop them up, and crisis chaos will assume. <laughs> you go, uh, maybe not. Well, what we've seen so far this <clears throat> week is that there's actually been quite strong demand for the T-bills that are coming out. Because remember, going into the debt ceiling crisis, and because of it, the Treasury Department actually reduced the amount of bills outstanding. And with all the money flowing out of bank deposits and into money market mutual funds to get the higher yields, um, there's just been a lot of demand for that paper. So th th there probably is a point where d bills have to be much cheaper in order for 2A7 money market mutual funds to care, but we're not there yet. And, and I think the next week's auctions will still be pretty strong. Yesterday, the Bank of Canada, and actually just Canada in general, as John was mentioning, it really sucked the oxygen out of the room in a lot of ways. Yeah. But one of the things that the Bank of Canada did was they raised rates, even though they weren't expected to by a consensus. This followed what we saw from the Reserve Bank of, uh, of Australia. And it raises the question of whether we could see something similar from the Federal Reserve next week. Do you give any credence to those kinds of discussions? Yeah, I think it's not completely out of the question. And, and I think we have an interesting dynamic right now is, is do, do I think that the Federal Reserve should uh, hike interest rates more. I don't think that they have to, but I think that the Federal Reserve is still worried about the inflationary environment that we have and the fact that inflation hasn't uh, declined as quickly as they had hoped. So when when we get the uh, the CPI report for May on Tuesday morning, right when they're about to start their meeting, that could really signal if, if that comes in even hotter or, or, you know, you wind up getting a 0 0.4, 0 0.5 on headline CPI on a month-to-month -month basis, it's possible that the Fed could say, we have to hike, you know, because if they don't hike, then the market's going to probably going to say, well, maybe they're done. But the problem is what's changed, right? It's one week. Everyone's talking about we're going into recession. The banks are going to have a massive crisis. We're just seeing the beginning of it, the long and variable lags. The next week we're talking about we're totally missing the boat. The resilience is un un unbelievable. And you're seeing the lag effects of the stimulus from the pandemic. Yeah. What has shifted so violently to spur the shift it, it, in sentiment? It's well, nothing. And, and I think that that's that just shows you how fragile people's sentiment actually is right now and how undecided a lot of investors are in, you know, whether or not the Fed Reserve's 500 basis points of interest rate increases is enough or not. And um, so, so, so I think that we're at the point, and, and this always happens whenever you reach the top or the bottom, is it's a will they or won't they. Now, you know, they, they haven't cut interest rates to, to zero, right? We knew that kind of when interest rates got to zero that they were done cutting. But when interest rates are on the upside, there still is that little bit of wiggle room that the Federal Reserve might decide to take. Now, now I think what the market's mispricing, if we were going to talk about the very short-term mispricing, is that if the Fed is on hold, um, that does decide not to hike next week, right. 
July is not a done deal. And the market right now is pricing for the Fed to be a done deal and hike in July if they skip in uh, uh, if they skip in June. And and I think that it's more like a 50-50 in July if they decide not to go. I got eight ways to go here. And to remind people, this is Ira Jersey, where the world stopped long ago at Credit Suisse with Dominique Constant and others over shocking minutia, which I, I think I studied and flunked on a number of exams. <laughs> and Ira's like legitimate adult on this stuff. Do you frame 6% yields, 5.90, 6.00, 6.1% full faith and credit yields? Well, I, I think it will be very difficult for uh, for longer term yields, like ten year yields, to get up to those kinds of levels. Because even if the Federal Reserve were to hike, say to six percent, and and, and they're still, stay there is the they would have to stay there for a very long period of time. You still probably only get ten year yields, say up to four and a half or five percent. You don't get them up to six percent, primarily because if they as soon as the Fed stops, the market is going to right. always be pricing for <clears throat> interest rate cuts later. The question will be to what magnitude okay. and, and what that terminal floor is. But witness T-bills in the last couple of weeks. What you and I were weaned on is the foreigners always came in and rescued with demand for our paper pushing price up and yield down. We'd literally try to model the Greenspan delta there of three quarters, 75 basis points, whatever. Is that Why won't that repeat again? Well, it <clears throat> it could, and, and you're seeing that in in private investors. So, so you have to break out what's going on with some of the foreign dynamic. And on the panel later today, that's one of the questions that I want to talk with it's our chief, chief investor. I am a See, little bit. See, I was bit. doing that. <laughs> you're doing great. Keep it's, going. Um, but, but it's the <laughs> dynamics between central banks who are not yet really full-out buyers of the short end of the yield curve, as you were alluding to, and private investors, uh, foreign investors, that are buying the long end, that tend to buy more 10-year, 30-year debt. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think you have some of these yield curve dynamics that we're seeing. And, and there, there's no reason why that won't continue, because you still have the U.S. is relatively cheap, so yields are higher here in the U.S. than they are in a lot of the rest of the world. Tom said something last uh, in the last hour that I thought was fascinating when we were just speaking yesterday, just a, a couple minutes ago, and he said, this is a conversation we would have been having 15 years ago. This is something people keep saying. Suddenly, for the first time in two decades, the Fed doesn't matter as much. This isn't about where they push rates. This isn't about accommodation. How much is that really driving the theses that you're hearing as well from investors as you talk with them? Not necessarily, well, the Fed's going to do this. This is our, our, our benchmark, but more, this is the distortion here. Maybe we can play this in the short term because we have no clue what's going to happen. Well, I think it's the no clue of what's going to happen uh, aspect of, of the market dynamics currently that, that are the issue. And and you're right. Like, like the, the Federal Reserve <clears throat> hiking another 25 or even 50 basis points is way less important than the fact that they already hiked 500 basis points, right? So, so you can take the Federal Reserve a little bit out of the market. That being said, I think that there is a lot of questions about what's going on with the banks, what's going on in the financial sector, going back to the rebuild of the Treasury's cash balance with all of this T-bill issuance might create more volatility in the markets. We all remember September 2019 when reserve balances got to what I call the tipping point. Some people call it the lowest common uh, you know, level of reserves or whatever it's called, but let's call it the tipping point for now. Once we get to that reserve tipping point, you can see significant significant volatility in funding markets. That will uh, creep into risk asset markets. Right. And we wind up with, with with a lot of volatility where the Federal Reserve becomes important again, because the Fed will have to do something because they've uh, created this issue kind of artificially by having so many reserves in the system. All right, Jersey, stay with us. we got to comment on this. This is just out in Bloomberg News reports that Virginia Drosos and Hamilton Bermuda with Signet Jewelers, Lisa, Signet CEO says couples buying lower priced engagement rings. I mean, there's an economic bellwether if I've ever seen one. Yeah, I mean, we saw it with respect to people trading down from Whole Foods to Walmart for their uh, grocery shopping. This is perhaps a step further. Uh, it's a pretty significant investment, and it seems like this uh, trade down is happening in more sectors, but it really feeds into this theme. People are deciding where they want to spend their money. They might travel more, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily also going to buy a Cartier ring. Well, du double digit. No, we're not going to buy a Cartier ring, are we, Ira? Uh, double digit uh, same store sales 
sales down as well. But you know, there's little there's little things here which get into the growth. We don't have time to continue with Ira because his entourage is saying he's got to go up to his panel uh, right now. But you know, these are important things. I, I frankly, I think that what the Signet Blue Nile diamond ring person says is just as important as what some Fed president says when you tell me Absolutely. six are talking. Absolutely. And it was telling you there is discretion starting to feed into the market. Stay with us. Claims next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance Worldwide on radio and television. John Farrell preparing for the next hour. I'll have Nassim Taleb here coming up in 9 or 10 o'clock hour. I'm sure when that uh, is. Looking forward to that. And we get to claims here in a moment. Lisa, we got to talk about the fog that's out there. It's not fog. It's really serious. People with headaches, people really affected all across the Northeast down to Washington. And businesses closing early in some places as well because people are trying to protect themselves and their workers. This comes at a time where we're getting news that it's going to be maybe even until Tuesday uh, until the weather patterns change. This has been your weather uh, report. But this is serious. It's serious for a lot of people, and it really highlights <coughs> the nature of the interconnectedness right. of fires, the worst wildfires that Canada has ever seen. Washington affected their ra rating of uh, air quality is a little better than New York, which is not saying much. Let's call them both unhealthy. Philadelphia is hazardous and also hazardous is going to Michael McKee for the claims data when it's not there. I mean, you <laughs> see it, Mike? I don't it see it a, in the it Bloomberg It is a bit right of a now. problem. It is it's a bit hazardous. Maybe uh, <laughs> the smoke has breaking gotten the news. focus yeah, of breaking your news uh, nothing. Department of Labor, or maybe they laid off the person who's supposed to put it in to the Here system. We there we go. Uh, 261,000, so a significant change in the uh, number of jobless claims. That is about 30,000 and more than we had uh, in the prior week. I'm looking for the uh, revision that comes over uh, more slowly. Uh, 1,757,000 continuing claims, which is a drop. But remember, um, not every claim gets paid and not everybody stays on jobless claims. So uh, that is not unusual. But 261,000 is a uh, fairly impressive number in the sense of we're looking for, uh, we were looking for a decline. So here's a revision 233 so it's a gain of 28,000 in the week now uh it's one week i'll warn you that and it always is not uh, worth uh, changing all of your views on the mm. fed and the markets based on one week's data but if let's do it anyway this is the start of a trend <laughs> yeah tom's gonna do it anyway um if this is the start of a trend then uh it is some good news for the fed in the in the sense Tom's whispering over there in the sense that they're going to be seeing what they want to see. They don't want to see people yeah. lose jobs, but they, they expect the labor market to weaken. Where's the number for you in your head? I'm looking at a fancy chart here. Two standard deviations out. We had pandemic slide in 2021, massively range bound. And now for the second time, we've breached two standard deviations up. Is it a jump condition? No, but at 261, we're getting there. Where's the number in your head where things change? I don't know if necessarily there is one because the <clears throat> jobless claims uh, are riddled with problems, which we discovered during the right. uh, the overall pandemic. But uh, significantly higher, somewhere closer to 300,000, <clears throat> I suppose you would start saying it is, uh, it is moving in that right. direction. The question is... Is this a one-off, as we saw the last time we went up big, or is this right. the start of a trend? Lift to the equity markets here, uh, fractionally, I should say, out of red. The yield space uh, moves in. I was like, oh, it's a churn, I'm going to say again, on well, yields. Dollar weaker, fractionally. What else, Lisa? What well, do you say? I will just say that, you know, Mike said you can't really make a call on the Fed with one report, and yet— Essentially, that's what people are kind of gaming out here in the market, that basically this takes the Fed, all things being equal, off the table. I mean, we could change that in five minutes, but that basically two-year yields falling uh, quite significantly, five basis points, not you know to write home about, but you're seeing the dollar index hit uh, intraday highs. You're seeing the euro gain considerably versus the dollar. So this is basically saying it takes some pressure off the Fed, and that is the big message from right. an upward uh, revision if, to if, a jobless If you're going to look at anything, it does take the pressure off the Fed next week a little bit. We'll see what happens with CPI. But with these kind of numbers, <clears throat> it justifies them maybe not 
moving. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Looking forward to inflation analysis uh, next week. Joining us now is really one of the key calls within the Bloomberg surveillance world. It's rarely that you get somebody to give you a statistic or directional call and also throw a date on it. Matthew Lozetti and the team led by Peter Hooper and David Folkert's land out Deutsche Bank had the courage to do that a long, long time ago. They said there is going to be a slowdown, some form of NBER recession, but it's going to be out there. He nailed that call. We get an update this morning with Mr. Luzzetti. Okay, let's go to the timed element now. Which week, which day, which hour do we get a recession? Yeah, you know, that, that timing is always very difficult. Um, when okay, we, I'll let you go we, to a month. Well, Give me the month. <laughs> we're still Q4. We, we, up, we updated our outlook um, this week, kept the recession timing in Q4. You know, I think it's based on we've seen the Fed tighten, uh, obviously, very aggressively. You've seen credit conditions tighten. You've seen some breadcrumbs within the labor market data of some softening. I'd be cautious about this morning's data just because there's a lot of volatility. There's seasonal adjustment issues. There's states that are they're moving around. But if you look at the last Friday's jobs report, it showed the permanent job losers really rising. Um, and that's, an, I think, an important, important indicator. And then as you look forward for the consumer, uh, you have excess savings dissipating by the end of the year. You have student debt payments coming back. Um, and so we think it's a consumer that looks a lot weaker by, by the end of this year. What gives you confidence, especially since people have been pushing out this date again and again and again? Yeah, I don't think you want to express too much confidence on any particular month or quarter, to be honest. You know, the labor market has proven to be more resilient. The consumer has proven to be more resilient. But I think, unfortunately, for the Fed, so has inflation. And, and that was kind of our expectation as you go back to last year. It was that the labor market was strong. It was that the consumer was strong. And then, therefore, inflation was going to be more persistent and the Fed would have to move more aggressively. Um, I think looking ahead, I think the Fed skips next week, barring a, a big upside surprise to, to CPI. But I also think that they tee up a rate hike over the next several meetings. We think that comes in July. If they skip, if they go through with that kind of shift, do you expect a meaningful move up in longer term yields? Or basically, people say maybe this is a sign that this Federal Reserve is willing to accept inflation uh, that is a two point something over the longer term? Yeah, I think that's the worry from their perspective, that you get this upward shift in inflation expectations um, because the market interprets it as they are losing some of their credibility or commitment to that 2 percent objective. And so I think they will want to do anything to, to push back or kind of tone that down that, that notion. I think even from the <clears throat> doves you've heard, you know, they want to skip, but they want to be very clear that this is not the peak of the, the tightening cycle, that there's very likely mm -hmm. uh, the potential for more rate hikes to come. We've given short shrift this week to the crew, including Ed Hyman at Evercore ISI, who say, look, we're going to disinflate with clarity in your note. And again, you've got the courage to put a date on it. Year end 2024, December of 2024, some kind of sub 3 percent inflation. How does our world change with, say, 2.65 percent inflation? I think it's all about how you get to there. Um, we, for our forecast at the end of next year, are down at two and a quarter percent core PCE. So it looks like the Fed no you know, is very close to there. No one's pricing that in right now. Well, I think it depends on how you get there. Now, if it's an immaculate <clears throat> disinflation where the labor market stays where it is, then that's an, an, a, kind of a fantastic outcome for the economy, for markets. If it's a recession that is needed to get you there, that it's a labor market that very, that very sure. much needs to weaken, I think it's a very different dynamic. The Fed, you know, I think their own forecasts have shown a need for some recession and rising unemployment. It's clear that the staff over the past several meetings have come to that conclusion as well. You know, we still hold that view, that they really do well, need this economy to slow materially, the <clears throat> labor market to weaken to get close to 2 percent. And the legacy of Deutsche Bank analysis, this even goes back to Adam Siminski and oil years ago, is always think dynamics. So I've got wage growth coming down, but I've got inflation screaming down to 2.x percent. Can we have a quote unquote Lizetti recession with actual real wage stability or real wage growth? I think what you will see is that wages will come down materially as the labor market weakens. And that is, I think, part of the Fed's game plan. They, they talk about, you know, wages being a very important input into that X service, yeah. core services, X shelter component. We think it's an important, the la overall labor market is an important input into to rental inflation. So to get back to 2 percent sustainably, I think you need uh, a, a softer labor market, and you, the Fed needs wage growth to come down closer to that, that metric that Chair Powell cites of 3 percent. Do you think that if they go again in July, assuming they skip next week, that the Fed is done after that? I think there's still upside risks. Um, you know, we have been, I think everybody has been consistently surprised 
And those surprises have all been in one direction, which is inflation stickier, labor market stronger, consumer a bit more resilient than anticipated. And so you don't want to discount the kind of serial correlation in those in those surprises. Um, could we get more? I think it's, it's certainly possible, which could push the Fed to raise rates. Raise rates beyond, again. yeah, again, yeah. Uh, beyond five and a half percent. I'm just wondering, though, from your perspective, as we headed to this mid-year point and everybody writes their mid-year outlooks, whether there's anything that you're kind of changing, shifting, second guessing from the first half uh, that you think will be a driving theme heading into the next six months. Yeah, for us, it's definitely the, the potential that this cycle takes a little bit longer to play out and that, therefore, the recession doesn't come by <clears> the end of this year, but, but a little bit later. I think for us, the key has been that we push mm -hmm. back the, the timing of rate cuts. Um, we're now in March of next year, in part because the unemployment rate takes takes a bit right. longer to, to get there. I think just one you know, important counterfactual here is that if we had not had these banking stresses emerge, it looked likely that the Fed was going to raise rates by 50 basis points in March. And having done that, I think they probably would have done so in May. And so the counterfactual is we'd probably be 50 basis points higher on the Fed funds rate. Right. The key question for them is, are credit conditions tightening enough to offset that? What's the counterfactual of China? Do they export disinflation, even outright deflation? What do they do with their the struggles they seem to be having? How does that change the American model? It, it's certainly, the, the global growth impulse that people are expecting from China is seemingly not there as much as, as anticipated. I think the real concern from an inflation perspective in the U.S., however, has been uh, then not only is services elevated, we've seen core goods inflation over the past three or four months also bounce back. Now, last month was all about used cars, so you want to discount that a little bit. But go back three or four months before mm -hmm. that, it was broad-based. It was household furnishings. Right. It was <clears throat> medical goods. And so there's – even in that category that we have the most confidence that you're going to get this big disinflationary well, impulse. Tell me you're not walking back to the office. You're I am, walking, actually. You, come on. It's, it's, it's like deadly out there. Do you have a mask? And I, I do have a mask. mask. You, have, yes. you guys have some down in the lobby, yes. so I, I will Oh, you I'll grab you're one. taking one of Mike's last masks. So. I, brought, I brought one for myself. So I'm going to so. go out there and die today. <laughs> I'll Let's leave go. one for you. I'll take leave one. one for you. <laughs> Matt Lozzetti walking across Central Park. Matt, what do you call the building? The Deutsche Bank Center. The Time Warner, Time Warner Center. CNN <laughs> Deutsche, Deutsche, Deutsche Bank, Bank Center. Center. Just okay. the Deutsche Bank Center. <laughs> Very exciting. Well, we looked. At, we will do something over there sometime here. Mr. Mr. Lozzetti is at Deutsche Bank. But that's really what's come down to, Lisa, is like, okay, should the kids walk five blocks? And I'm like, eh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, they're healthy, but still. They're healthy and they're still coughing. Stuff. They still come back with burning nostrils and they fall on the couch and <clears throat> just go to sleep. First time I went to Beijing, I was ensconced in the St. Regis. Life is tough. So they got me a car to go to the office. I said, oh, no, I don't need a car. I'm like Matt Luzzetti. I can walk. <laughs> Who did? It took me six hours for my brain to recover from the pollution and the walk. Six hours. I sat there in the office with a screaming headache. So I'm going to blame that tomorrow when I come in. Uh, it's just taking too long to recover from the uh, from the smog. That's the reason why well, my mind is not picking up clearly. Well, get the surveillance Bentley to take you home tomorrow. That's all there is to it. Green and red on the screen. Claims higher. No question about that. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Some 230 square miles of Ukraine's southern Kherson region is underwater two days after the destruction of the Kohovka Dam. Now, the regional governor says almost a third of the flood zone, where thousands are being evacuated, is held by Ukrainian forces, while the rest is in Russian-occupied territory. Kyiv is assessing the humanitarian, economic, and ecological damage of the disaster that Western leaders denounced as a war crime. Michel Barnier, former EU chief Brexit negotiator and author of My Secret Brexit Diary, offered some insight into the post-Brexit landscape for the UK and EU. He spoke earlier with Bloomberg. As far as trade is concerned, at the end of the road or at the beginning of the road, uh, there is an economic reality. Uh, we are now in two separate markets, UK and EU. And uh, the reality is that the EU market, single market, count 450 million consumers and citizens, 22 million business. That is the reality. And uh, if you are on the side of the US or China or India, uh, they know this reality. The UK Prime Minister met with US business leaders and politicians ahead of a visit to the White House to see President Joe Biden today. And House Speaker Kevin McCarthy called off votes for the remainder of the week and sent lawmakers home. 
A revolt by Republican hardliners halted business in the chamber for a second day. The blockade by a band of 11 ultra conservatives heightened tensions among Republicans following the speaker's backing of a compromise with the White House to avert a U.S. debt default. The speaker says he was blindsided by the revolt. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. I think getting together is the best thing for golf. This fight that was going on and the lawsuits that were uh, raging and uh, one side, the golfers from live and, uh, you know, taking shots at the uh, PGA and vice versa, that's not constructive for the game. Henry Kravis, a really quite heated yesterday, really interesting conversation with Jason Kelly here. Bloomberg Invest, Mr. Druckenbiller darkened the door uh, yesterday. And there's Ann Maletti I saw walk by uh, with Allspring in Milwaukee. And uh, I'll be with Nassim Taleb here, I believe, in the 10 o'clock hour. Really interesting. I tried to make it a two-hour conversation, and that got vetoed. But I don't know. We'll have a good conversation with uh, Nassim Taleb. See if we're fooled by randomness. He's got a new book out. I'll sell it to you one more time on radio. Chaos Kings. This is very important. Scott Patterson writing this up uh, with all his work at the Journal. And it's, it's a really, really extraordinary uh, book. <clears throat> on golf now, it would pay to, some, to talk to somebody that actually understands sport. John Garamendi is a Democrat from Sacramento. But far more than that, He's someone at Berkeley who was second-team All-American in football. He is someone that had a legit football prospect with the Dallas Cowboys and the Oakland Raiders. And he said, no, I'm going to go over to the Peace Corps with the love of my life to Ethiopia. And that was the end of his football career. He did so well in California politics, lieutenant governor, of course, insurance commissioner, and joins us here on the combat of modern sport. John, I can imagine the Saudis wanting to buy the Dallas Cowboys or something like it. Compare your analysis of this golf transaction, regulation, and monopoly with the shock if, if the Saudis or someone wanted to buy the Dallas Cowboys. Well, actually, that uh, kind of thing has happened in the uh, soccer leagues of the world. Uh, the super wealthy, uh, some of them from the uh, Middle East, do own one of the key soccer teams uh, in Europe. So, yes, it does happen. But this, this situation in golf is uh, really unparalleled. What has happened is that the, uh, the leagues, the uh, PGA leave and, and the European leagues, have formed a monopoly. and. They do not pay American taxes, so they can come into the United States, uh, make billions, which uh, certainly the PGA already has at least a billion and a half annual revenue, and it considers itself a charity and does not pay corporate or any taxes at all. So we're going to end that piece of it. With regard to the monopoly, if I were a professional, wanted to be a professional golfer, I have no choice now but to uh, bend my knee to this new monopoly. Uh, and if I wanted to sell golf clubs or I had a golf course, I've only got one choice. I'm going to have to take whatever they right. offer to me. Gauge the bipartisan support. What you, what's so different about Garamendi, folks, is he's been in the depths as insurance commissioner in California. Trust me, it's the worst job in California. <laughs> so, John, explain to me how you're going to garner bipartisan support against the lobbying of the golf people, but frankly, the lobbying of football, basketball, hockey, and the rest. Well, hockey, basketball, and the rest did have the same exemption. But over the years, uh, beginning almost a decade and a half ago, those exemptions were eliminated, and they do pay taxes uh, based on their uh, net income. So there's only one left, and that's the PGA. Uh, it considers itself to be a charity, does not pay taxes on their income. They're exempt from corporate taxation. We're going to end that. I think we got a real good shot at it. Interestingly, in the 2017 Trump Republican tax cut, this tax exemption in the early drafts of that bill was there to be eliminated. Uh, a fellow by whose initials were, uh, let's see, J.N. 
contacted the president or somebody in Congress and said, oh, no, no, you can't do away with the tax exemption. Uh, and it was removed in the final version of the 2017 tax bill. It's been floating around for a long while, uh, the yeah. el elimination of this exemption. My staff, one of my, uh, my legislative staff guy, he wakes up in the middle of the night and tries to identify the worst, grossest tax loopholes. And this was on his list. Yeah. He pulled it out uh, yesterday and said, why don't we run with this well, and eliminate this gross tax loophole? Congressman, there's a larger issue here as well <clears throat> when it comes to U.S. relations with the Middle East, with some of the uh, areas that are trying to plow into a lot of the major sport that people uh, really depend on, including golf. I'm wondering how much pushback you're getting from within your own party, especially at a time when Tony Blinken right now is meeting with over in Riyadh with MBS <coughs> trying to work out some peace deal. How much are people unwilling to really poke the bear in this particular instance? Well, we ought to do more than poke the bear. It really, really angers me that we are forced to bend our knee to MBS, to Saudi Arabia that has the worst human rights record uh, perhaps in the world, and we know has uh, assassinated and then hacked up a journalist who was uh, critical of Saudi Arabia. We should never, ever put ourselves in the position of being subservient to anybody, and certainly, certainly not cool. to Saudi Arabia. Now, just keep in mind, they've stuck the United States and really the world with an increase in petroleum prices just in the last week. They decided to cut their production, the result of which is America is going to wind up paying more for the gasoline and fuel that we consume. At the same time, this merger is going to give Saudi Arabia access to the American market, access to American money, and not have to pay taxes. That just really pisses me off. Well, I just, again, I wonder, though, and, and to your point, how much you have support from other members of the Congress at a time when they don't want necessarily OPEC plus making another cut. They don't want a continuation of these cuts. They don't want oil prices to keep going up. How do they sort of gain leverage at a time where uh, they might be equally angered as you, but might uh, have these other interests as well? Well, let's put it this way. If Saudi Arabia thinks it can come to America, run a business in America, and not pay taxes, something is seriously wrong with that equation. And that's exactly where the situation is today. And we, as Americans, ought to say, yeah, yeah fine. If you like this merger, I do not. But if you like this merger, then go ahead. But by God, you're part of this system, and you're going to pay taxes. And that's that. You're not a charity by any stretch of the imagination. And this loophole, this gross tax loophole, simply has to end. Congressman, 10 years ago or so, you decided that the nation had to honor a golfer named Jack Nicholas. You put in legislation in the House. I'm not sure quite how it came out, but I want you to comment on a time past of Garamendi on Palmer, Nicholas, and the sportsmanship that's out there. I saw that at Oak Hill at the PGA tournament of a couple weeks ago. It sounds like because of greed and money, we're blowing up what we knew. What can your shop on Capitol Hill do to get out front of this? Well, there are two specific issues in play here. One is the tax uh, loophole, which uh, my legislation would close, and this new uh, monopoly uh, would then have to pay corporate taxes, as would any other corporation, and, and that raises a whole other question about American corporations that do not pay taxes, but we'll let that go for a while. The other issue is one of competition, and what has been created here is an international monopoly on professional golf. Uh, that raises very, very serious questions of competition or no competition. As I said at the outset here, if I wanted to be a professional golfer, I could have chosen to play golf uh, in Europe or uh, in the United States or in this new leave league. Now I have but one choice. I'm going to have to take whatever this new league offers me and I have no negotiation opportunity. Similarly, if I have a golf course, um, I don't know, call it Bedmester, uh, Trump's golf course, 
he could have gone and, and negotiated with uh, th uh, two different leagues for the use of his golf course. Now he's mm -hmm. going to take whatever they offer him. He's he a has no choice. The so there's a monopoly issue here, and I would expect Congress to take mm -hmm. that up. And if we don't, certainly the European Union should. Congressman, thank you so much. The gentleman from Sacramento, the Democrat, John Garamendi, uh, they are all American football at Berkeley as well. I'm sorry. These guys talk differently. If they've done legit college sports or even pro sports, Lisa, they don't talk about the sports talk the same way mere mortals like you and I do. Curious to see how much support he gets for this, whether this actually does become some sort of talking point. And as you mentioned, I'm glad you brought it up. You mentioned the horrific issue with the Washington Post uh, individual in Saudi Arabia, and that's got to be a huge part of the dialogue. Uh, it is an interesting morning as well. Markets want to lift. They're sort of red and green on the screen right now. The 10-year yield was in substantially earlier, 3.79%. Stay with us. Nassim Taleb in the 10 o'clock hour. Good morning.